All right. Uh, I think we're ready to go. Okie dokie. Looks like uh, I've got some people streaming. Um, so yeah, let's uh, start. Um, Sounds good. Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Angel Rivera, I'm a developer advocate for Circle CI, and today we are hosting a, a, a good friend and a colleague in the dev in the developer relations, uh, I guess, ecosystem. Uh, Leon Steiger, Stiga, how do you say? Uh, Stichter, but that, that was close enough. Okay, yeah, sorry, my my German accent is. Uh, <laughs> it's Dutch. It's, uh, I know it's. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you, it, yeah. Dutch has a little bit more rougher, like sound, right? Like, I think in some words, maybe I don't. Know. Anyway, welcome, Liam. Uh, he's a developer advocate at uh, VMware. And uh, by the way, just introduce yourself. I mean, you know, you're my guest. So I just wanted to let you do your own intro. It's the best thing to do. Thank you. Really appreciate you having me. Uh, my name is uh, Leon Stichter. I am, as Angel said, part of uh, part of VMware, where uh, I get to focus on a bunch of super awesome things. Work with a lot of a lot of awesome engineers, but also a lot of awesome customers, and that that's the thing that that always excites me. Um, and based on like things I've done in in the past, and this is sort of why we're talking about what we're going to be talking about. Um, I'm always excited about about serverless and like what it means for for developers. And um, when we were sort of talking about what is it that we want to talk about today, I was like, you know, what? why not talk about serverless on Kubernetes? Absolutely, man. I think you and I just have some really good heated conversations uh, about serverless and, and Kubernetes for that matter. <laughs> yeah, right. And and uh, unikernels, right? But uh, and that too, yes. Yeah. So so some of the the discussions that we have are uh, I've been around this business a long time, so I've seen you know things go from basically zero to where we are today, uh, and there's a lot of technology, I guess, what people consider innovations, but if you really look at what they really are, just uh, different ways of of solving old problems, in my opinion. Uh, but they like to give it a little sheen, right, these solutions. Um, and yeah, sometimes, right, they, you do get some performance gains, some efficiencies. Uh, but in general, I think um, they're gaining a little bit of, uh, or they're, they're lessening the, the, the learning curve, right? So the, the yeah. kind of the ramping up. So and how you do that is by abstracting it a little bit at a higher level so folks can kind of comprehend what's going on. And then the people interested in maybe uh, digging a little deeper beneath that abstraction, right? Um, once they hit a wall, occasionally, or once you hit a wall with, like, let's say, serverless, right? So the idea be, let's talk about serverless. So, yeah, can you just define what that is? I mean, we're I'm kind of rambling on here. But. Sure. So I think that overall, um, AWS, which is uh, mostly seen as like the uh, the founding fathers of, uh, of of serverless, at least for general consumption, um, I think they do an excellent job at uh, at describing what uh, what serverless is, breaking it down into into four main pillars that uh, that, that that I tend to uh, tend to use as well. And if you look at it from a, a developer point of view, because that's that's the important thing here. I think serverless. Right is really focused at, at developers and, and obviously that also at least to me means DevOps teams, then um, it is all about making sure that you don't have to manage the infrastructure that you're running on. Someone else will take care of that for you. And if you're in if you're in something like AWS or, or GCP, then that's obviously the cloud provider. If you're in a large enterprise, then that could be your central platform team. Uh, so not managing as a developer or DevOps team the infrastructure, that is important. Um, the other thing that uh, that's that's critical is making sure that that it scales. And that goes from like zero to infinity and, and back to uh, back to zero again. So assuming that uh, we're obviously going to play around with some stuff today, uh, assuming that your application is is wildly successful, then you want to make sure that you don't have to scale that, that your platform takes care of that. 
And you know, during uh, during times that it's not as widely used, you want it to scale down and and make sure that you have that compute that that raw power available for other uh, other types of workloads. Uh, so then, so, oh sorry, <laughs> continue your thought. Okay, I was going to say then the the third thing to me is uh, I mean being Dutch, we you know we 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 love getting things for free and and paying as little as possible. Um, so the, the the third sort of pillar is is paying for value, and I, I think that actually makes sense because that is what you want to end up with. And and like the fourth, uh, which is which is sort of tying all of that together, is making sure that you have availability and fault tolerance built into uh, built into your platform. I mean, how bad is it if you have the most successful app on the planet, and then at some point it just it just breaks because a server is down, or because a network cable was pulled out, or because I mean, well, we we we've been in in this space long enough that you can imagine anything going wrong. That's right. So like when uh, S3 went down for a few days because someone rebooted a, a RD, 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 RDS server, right? Uh, and I see yep. that they had specific instructions don't reboot this, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, so for me, the arguments that I make, not, not against it, but like where, where, I, where I have these moments, right, where I go, well, I don't get it, right? Like, so serverless, I don't get it, right? And I, again, right, I think it's more about the marketing, right, the, the, the wording that kind of gets me a little bit riled up more, than, more so than anyone, anything, right? Because it kind of feels like when you have a marketing term like that, especially, uh, like I said, a person like myself and others, I know others feel that way that, that have kind of the the age that I have in this industry. It's like, wait a minute, you're pretty much just shitting all over <laughs> all of our experience by the, the kind of fooling the public. Like, hey, this serverless thing, you don't need to have this underlying uh, infrastructure. But that's exactly what you were saying. It's more of this serverless kind of ecosystem is geared more towards um, developers, right? And being able to uh, get them to ramp up and release their software a lot faster by not yeah. having to deal with, right, the underlying infrastructure uh, to a degree, right? So at some point, nothing is unlimited, right? There's no infinite compute, right? There, There is always uh, a, a data center. There is always a, a network bandwidth problem, right? Like limitation, there's always a, a even compute limitation, right? Like even, even uh, Amazon and those folks, they have, they have enough compute, you know, and they and they they have enough capacity to to handle pretty much, uh, you know, they're pretty smart about you know keeping capacity. But at the same token, what's to say if like you know a huge part of the population decides in one day at one time to go and hey, we're gonna just start spinning stuff up unexpectedly, boom, right there goes your capacity. So <laughs> uh, serverless to me. It's just another like you, and it, it's a good entry point or a good way that you phrased it, uh, which I actually haven't really heard before, right? I haven't never heard someone a proponent of serverless say it's a it's for the developers. <laughs> I've never heard that, right? As a matter of fact, I've heard it the opposite, where it's like, oh, you can leverage this to lessen your um, your uh, you know uh, uh, operators uh, keeping you know freeing them up to do things, right? And I think it just comes with the stigma of uh, it being an AWS thing, and most people look at AWS as a more of an operations type of right uh, platform. Uh, I know AWS doesn't want you to think of that of it that way, but I, in general, right, most people view it as oh, well, that's a ops thing, right? Like that's a dev ops thing. Uh, anyway, so um, the one thing I will say about serverless uh, is that it does help with cost for sure right like yes so uh and being able to to kind of centralize these functions or these processes that you generally don't really need a whole application for right uh one good thing i used to when when they when serverless or the lamb eight of this lambdas came on the scene i would use them as a cron job right all my cron yeah. jobs are sitting on scripts sitting in a box in my office underneath my desk that was doing these critical things, right? Uh, I said, well, wait a minute, I can put this up into the cloud and then right, manage them in Git and then you know, not have to deploy them to this little server I have running. 
Uh, the other side of that, though, is, um, you know, I think people are still struggling with what exactly you should put up in the cloud or in, in, a, in a serverless function, right? So, and then you're now getting a lot of um, tooling that's also being used. Uh, I wouldn't say they're called serverless, but basically they're just containerizing their apps and then serving it up in a, in a different mechanism, right? Yeah. All right, so I think we covered pretty much anyway that stuff and we'll probably get into it a little bit more later, but oh, uh, probably. let's jump into like what we're gonna cover today, what we're gonna do. Like let's, I know this thing was built as what, uh, I don't even remember. Or is it Kubernetes or serverless Kubernetes or something? I don't know, something like that. The uh, the title at the top of our screen, uh, at least you know the, the <laughs> one that we're looking at right now, says serverless frameworks on on Kubernetes. Um, uh, how, however, it's going to be accurate, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, exactly. So I mean, so the serverless part for everyone watching, definitely accurate. Um, we are also going to be looking at at least one uh, that is that is not Kubernetes. Um, simply to sort of show what, uh, uh, or, or sh show some of the things that uh, that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. um, so you know what? Let me uh, pull this one, this window here, and then figure out if I can still share my screen. I oh mean, yeah, I, I know. Yeah. yeah, and then I'll, I'll uh, try. Uh, Okie dokie. I think it Maybe should be cool. visible. Oh, nice! I can see it on the other screen too. That's that's actually super useful. Can you uh, blow that up a little bit? I was just about to say that. Oh, wait, wrong wrong window that I'm blowing up. Yeah, you can just drop it out then. Oh, okay. Ah, well, there it is. Can you can you make that thing wider? There you go. Full screen. Exactly. Effect. Yes. So this is. Speed. Sorry, can you repeat that? Can you uh, just expand it all the way, like full screen it? Because it's I think really it cool to read. There you go, that like that, yeah, perfect. And then, yeah, that's good. Should yeah. be good enough, right? If 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 not, just drop us a, a chat that it's, uh, yeah, unable to see it or whatever. That should be good enough. I think I can see it a little bit. And you can knock that hide that little tab down there. Get that annoying thing out of the way. Oh, no. ah, yes, thank you. No worries. Cool. So go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no worries. I mean, like I'm I'm learning how to use all, all these tools, which is, is actually pretty awesome. Uh, yeah. So the, the the team that that I work with at uh, at at VMware, which is uh, the the cloud developer advocates, they um they they built this amazing application which they call the uh, the Acme Fitness Shop, and I mean as the name implies, it's like a a e commerce uh, a fitness store where. Uh, where, where you can buy all sorts of things and then you know w walking through the uh, the workflow uh, essentially to demonstrate how uh, how how polyglot applications work together uh, and as I joined that team uh, one of the things simply because I, I like serverless I was like should we should we see whether or not it makes sense to uh, to build one in uh, in, in AWS uh, using using serverless tech there and they were like yeah you totally should so one of the repositories that uh, that I created, which is called uh, Acme Serverless, um, actually does that. So it has a bunch of services, and let me sort of scroll here. And I know it's it's like not not the biggest, but then at least you can you can sort of uh, get a grasp of, uh, of of what it is. Uh, it's like a bunch of services, a bunch of uh, uh, microservices or, or functions working all right. together to make sure that you know you can you, you can enjoy your time at the beach. Uh, there is this this one team at uh, at VMware that uh, that uses the uh, the hashtag beach ops, uh, which I love because you know I actually want to spend more time at the beach and less in front of uh, front of my computer uh, deploying stuff, monitoring stuff. Um, and I actually think serverless is is great for that because it it allows you to use a bunch of tools that will then help you, well, essentially go to the beach. So this is specifically for uh, for for AWS. And actually, let me uh, I'll just I'll just click on this, and then hopefully it should be like massively big. Um, so you can you can see the uh, uh, the different uh, different pieces in in a lot more detail. Um, and one of the reasons I uh, I actually like serverless to uh, to begin with 
is that it allows me to break down my functionality into into small pieces. So, for example, the uh, the user part that's that's now on screen has a bunch of a uh, bunch of functions like verify token, register, get user, uh, things like that. And if there is like an error in one of them, I can I can just go in, fix that, deploy that, and make sure that. Um, that that one is is updated. I don't have to go update all. I think it's like thirty five or something services uh, or functions that, uh, that that are part of this. Um, and even if like the uh, the catalog part is uh, is broken or, or something is happening there, I don't have to deploy all of that. I can just I can just deploy that one. So let's uh, let's actually look at some of that in more detail. And let me bring up. Uh, my uh, my VS Code, and I'll do the oh, I'll do the same thing here so that it uh, is at least somewhat bigger. Um, and this this is one of the uh, one of the services. So if I go back to uh, uh, to this one like here, uh, I'm actually looking at the where is it the payment service. So this is what we'll be deploying. Um, at least if you if you would follow along with like the entire instructions on uh, on that uh, on that repo, um, the, uh, the the queues are, are created separately to have sort of like a, a separation of, of infrastructure and, um, and and functions on top of that, uh, because as as you said, uh, Angel, uh, there there is this this sort of I think misconception that uh, that serverless is just for ops or just for dev. I actually think that serverless makes it easier for those teams to come together because there is a there is a broad understanding of what people should uh, should focus on, and I actually think that uh, that works really well. So this is oh, this is what we're going to be deploying, uh, specifically the payment function here. Now there are tons of ways to uh, to do that, and um, if you uh, if you Look at uh, at my screen Zoom over in. here. I sorry, buddy. sorry. Yeah, Zoom in, please. <laughs> Quite a bit. Uh, how do I? I don't do I command do plus. That. Command okay. plus. Oh really? That actually works. Too. Oh nice. Oh, that's pretty cool. Keep going. Keep going. So I um, specifically for one this. Mo one more. One more, Leon. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just like it's. There you go. Perfect. Okay. Awesome. Man. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so specifically for, uh, uh, for, for the payment service, I actually created a bunch of ways that, uh, that you can deploy it um, because I, I obviously wanted to make sure that uh, if I use this for demos, it would work out well uh, regardless of, uh, uh, of what I do. So you're now actually looking at a uh, Circle CI config YAML. So that should be super familiar to you, Angel. Uh, oh, yeah. And yeah, right? Uh, and I'm, I'm actually using a bunch of uh, a bunch of orbs uh, uh, in this case specifically for uh, for, for Pulumi, um, so that I can you know update a, a bunch of things. There is a, a specific one for cloud formation, um, so that you can sort of see what uh, what the differences are. And then just to make it uh, make it easy for me to deploy as I'm running on on my local machine, I also have this uh, this Pulumi folder here. Uh, which actually goes all the way through uh, through deploying. And the nice thing about uh, uh, about using something like Pulumi is that I can uh, that I can write my deployment in the exact same language as I do uh, the rest of the code. So this is based in uh, in Go. If you wanted to use something else, that's that's possible too. Uh, so essentially, what I'm what I'm doing, uh, I'll sort of walk you through. Uh, what I'm doing here, and then uh, actually run the uh, the command so that you can see what happens, is I'm essentially building up the entire set of uh, of things that uh, that that get deployed. So I'm creating the uh, the function. I'm actually creating a zip file that uh, that you deploy. Then I'm deploying that up to uh, uh, up to AWS. I'm creating a bunch of new roles because you know at the end of the day we want to make sure that it's safe and secure. So that it has the uh, the least privileges, um, and then the nice thing is I'm actually looking up the SQS queues. So um, rather than than creating them in advance, or rather than creating them here in this script, 
I'm sort of assuming that that those already exist so that my platform team or, you know, someone has already created that for me. And then I'm just deploying stuff. So I'm, I'm making sure that everything is wired up. So let's open up a terminal. So I'm just packing on that. Um, I think let's let's take a step back and and okay. You, you started talking about you know serverless and we're showing code. And I think we didn't, we sk kind of skipped over the uh, the point the part where you know we're talking about um, the different serverless frameworks. We didn't really touch on that, right? Good point. So, yes. So uh, what we were discussing earlier before, you know, kind of show, to, to detail some of the stuff we're doing is, uh, for those of you that don't know, there there are, and you did touch on it very lightly, but there are many different serverless frameworks out there today, right? There's uh, Open FAS, there's AWS Lambdas, there's uh, Knative now, right? So these are yeah. these are kind of the the uh, the projects or, or, or offerings that are out there for serverless. There's even proprietary companies that also have, right, their own kind yep. of offering. And they're all different, right? So like, just like, uh, you know, you don't deploy the same way to Amazon or, or AWS or, or, uh, or GCP, Google Cloud or Azure, right? They're all, they have all different kinds of deployment mechanisms. Uh, same thing with serverless, or it, again, it's a, it, it's a it's a it's a basically an SDK, right? That you can you can kind of write your program in a certain way, and then um, it has to be packaged in a certain manner. Which is uh, what we're showing you right now is the Lambda, right? We're doing the Lambda uh, serverless. Yep. So uh, that's why Leon has a little bit more of a of a, of a, a comprehensive or, or more com robust kind of packaging solution versus. Uh, like if you would go to with K Native, it would be a, a little bit different, which we'll cover. But I just wanted to make clear that right now we're focusing in on the we're going to cover today Lambda and K Native, which seem to be the the, the two of the most popular, right? Uh, in, yeah. in your experience, uh, I, again, I'm very new to to serverless, so I'm going to be learning quite a bit from Leon here. Uh, but I just wanted to make that clear to to our audience that um, yeah, we're basically um, going to cover uh, AWS Lambdas and then K Native, and right now you are doing uh, lambdas, yeah? Yeah, exactly. And I actually think that you touched on a really good point that uh, I sort of skipped over, that as you're looking at those those different frameworks, and I'll actually show you too before we uh, before we deploy, um, the like the function signature, the the way that your your functions are called, they are actually different from uh, from from like vendor to vendor, from framework to uh, to framework. Um, so this one is specifically for uh, AWS Lambda, where it's receiving things from uh, from an SQS queue. So you can see that my function signature here has a, an SQS event that uh, that it essentially builds off of. Um, and if you would look at, uh, for example, I have a uh, a very similar one that uh, that is triggered by uh, by AWS Event Bridge or Amazon Event Bridge, sorry, that actually just gets the raw JSON message. And uh, the nice thing about AWS Lambda is that all of them are started by uh, the exact same uh, signature here, so wrapping it in, in Lambda start. Um, and that essentially means that assuming that you're running it in uh, one single provider, your, your method or your, your way of working is, is going to be extremely standardized. And I think that is one of the reasons why a lot of developers have, uh, have embraced serverless because it allows you, as you said, to really speed up your development. Because that whole boilerplate, if you will, that's automatically generated for you. That just comes out of the box. If you yeah. compare it, I was gonna ask you. So, like, when I when I uh, when I started, you know, messing around with serverless, uh, I was there wasn't many languages or yeah, languages supported, right? So, in the beginning, it was like Java and Python. I think, yeah, those were the two yeah. main uh, languages, and obviously they've grown. What what do they support now? Uh, oh, um, so as if you specifically look at uh, at, at AWS, then um, as you said, they started out with I think Java, uh, JavaScript, or, or Node.js, uh, depending on on how you want to call yeah, it. Yeah, there was Node. There was Node as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
And then obviously uh, uh, Python was there, and I think .NET was there or came along pretty fast. No, it um, wasn't. It wasn't there, <laughs> but it came. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I remember there was only like two or three, and that's what the okay. point I wanted to make was with with AWS and and serverless in general, right? Uh, does it mean that those frameworks always support every language, right? So that's another kind of thing that's evolving in the serverless landscape is. Um, the, the compatibility or the yeah the, the, the compatibility and addition of uh, frameworks and languages and stacks right that 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 are supported um, yeah so be aware that you know there there are some limitations they may not have an offering or support for the language of your choosing uh, right now but uh, if you know it could be changing that could change uh, later on definitely. Oh yeah, I mean, I think that was actually a brilliant thing that uh, that Google Cloud did with uh, uh, with their Google Cloud Run, uh, which is like a, a sort of productized version of of Knative, where they actually said, you know what, um, we'll we'll give you a bit more uh, more control as a developer because in this case you uh, you bring your your container to us, but that literally means that any any language you want to use, as long as you can package that into a container that is what you can run there, which is to me pretty awesome. Um, AWS Lambda followed suit uh, relatively soon after where they introduced the concept of, uh, uh, of custom language runtimes, if I use the, the correct terminology there, that essentially says that uh, AWS has a, as a base set of, uh, of languages that, uh, that they support, uh, Go being uh, luckily for me one of them. Uh, but if you want, you can actually bring your own runtime um, like Rust is, I think, a runtime that uh, that people created, and I, if I remember correctly, uh, one of the one of the partners from AWS actually created a a COBOL runtime for uh, for Lambda, so that you know if you want to run COBOL functions in uh, in AWS, that's absolutely possible, which I think is fascinating. Not that I'd be able to write that, but uh, I mean, it's it's actually pretty awesome that that you can do that. Yeah, it's uh, so I think my microphone was jacked, <laughs> but we've got it now, I think. All right, can you hear me, Leo? Sorry. Yes, yes, I can. All right, cool. Does it sound better now? <laughs> I, I don't really hear a massive difference, but uh, oh, okay. okay. Cool. <laughs> so um, apparently, it's efficient. Sorry. Cool. Uh, so, where, where were we? Uh, yeah. Um, so the the signature, depending on like how you want your uh, your function to be invoked, is is, is different. Um, so the one that we're going to be de deploying is uh, is started by uh, by SQS events. Um, I I could have done the the event bridge one as well, but uh, coming from a messaging background, I actually kind of like SQS. Uh, so that's that, that's essentially why I'm biased. I'm okay with that. So uh, I think that um, well, SQS will give you a little bit more uh, flexibility too, right? So yeah. So one of the nice things about, and I think this is true for uh, for for really building scalable serverless systems in in general, that you you have to think about how can I make sure that. I, I keep the messages or that I don't lose them if my function isn't available or if it has to start up. And something like uh, like SQS or something like uh, Kafka or RabbitMQ, uh, those things are awesome to keep track of, of your messages. Um, it also really decouples the, uh, the functions that have to work together. So for example, um, if you look at the, uh, actually, let me, let me just really quickly bring that up. So if you, for example, look at, at this flow here, which goes from, from payment to a, a shipping service, um, I could have done that in a way that the payment service directly calls the shipping service and the uh, shipping service calls a, a different shipping service. Uh, the thing is though, that in that case, your timeout and, and the, uh, the time it takes to report back is, uh, is essentially going to compound based on all of those things that, uh, that come together. So um, it's the time that it takes to validate the payment plus the time that it takes in, in all the other uh, um, 
in, in all the other functions. And if you can break that down, if you can make that more asynchronous, then you actually get a better user experience. So rather than waiting all the way until something's done, like right after I validate the, uh, the payment, it sends a message back saying, okay, this, this is great. We will we'll start validating. And if it's validated, we'll, uh, we'll actually go, go ship it. There's no need for you to wait until that, that entire flow is done. Uh, and that, that's, that's why, yeah, so that, that's why things like a, 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 what they call event-driven architecture uh, is actually so super useful and very much to your point that sort of old things are becoming new again. Um, the, the ideas that, that we had, uh, we, as in like the broader uh, uh, IT yeah. ecosystem, I think, with, uh, with SOA and, and, you know, the whole idea of, of APIs, uh, that essentially is, uh, is stuff that works really, really well with, uh, with serverless. That, that whole idea works just, just great. That's, I mean, you know, that also lends itself to where we are today with even software development, right? And architecture, architecting our software now. I know maybe f four or five years ago, microservices kind of blew up, right? That was like the, yeah. the new hotness. And then companies invested millions and millions of man hours and time uh, and money in, in decoupling these monolithic applications. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, we decoupled way too far, right? So like everything was supposed to be a microservice and then, uh, and you know, that was supposed to make things more lightweight. People could, you know, it kind of followed that agile mentality where you make things, you know, break things apart to make it more simple. But there is such a thing as decomposing way too much, right? Beyond yeah. being efficient. And they, you know, companies, myself included, and when I was working in, in different companies, realized really, really quickly that, uh, yeah, this microservices is kind of bullshit in a sense. <laughs> well, it's dangerous, right? It, it can be a cutting edge sword. Uh, and I think people just went with like, you know, decoupling, 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 and without really uh, understanding the ramifications, right? And the impact it would have further down the road. So now we're seeing um, those same teams recouple <laughs> but at a, at a in, in a, a little bit smarter right so they realize yeah. like hey we, we decoupled this serve this monolith down to uh uh you know basically every almost every function was a, it's on its own uh and that's not going to work right because there are dependencies that you need to kind of tie together to make those those kind of services stand out one good one is and i people always ask me like okay well if you decouple too much what kind of services you know in general uh, definitely user policy fabrics, right? So any kind of user maintenance, or if you have a, a system that you know you have to track users in, which is pretty much everything these days, definitely a good candidate for a microservice, right? Take those fun that functionality, make it its own, because it can live by itself, right? Yeah. It, can, it can basically be an API to some other service. Uh, another good candidate would be uh, take down uh, things like, uh, uh, any kind of uh, or ordering or inventory asset systems, right? You can basically create a, an asset service that basically you know, just ha serves up lists of things that are maybe you know stored in that in a database. Um, you know, those concepts have to be kind of thought through. And what what happened earlier was um, in in the first kind of like uh, I call it the microservices uh, the devolution <laughs> was uh, <laughs> you know people kind of made choices, they were the wrong choices, uh, and they were wrong because they, they didn't realize that they were losing efficiencies there, right? And I think once you get that right balance of, you know, hey, I'm gonna decouple things and devolve this application or decompose it, but uh, you're also measuring, you know, um, the impact it has. Uh, and, and, you know what I mean? Not just doing everything all at once, right? Just I, was always, I would always tell people from my experiences, take the, the, the services that are less critical out of a, out of, in a monolith, start there, right? Like yeah. decompose those, those, uh, func that functionality from a monolith into a, a microservice, and then have that monolith call your microservice. And then as you tease everything out, right, and decompose, 
uh, you'll know right away, like, oh, wow, this is a terrible mistake we're making. Or we, you know, we didn't include enough um, services, right? Because there could be consolidations you can make. Anyway, I'm going down my uh, my microservices. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I actually think you're right. And uh, I mean, let's let's not go down that rabbit hole, but there is a lot, there are a lot of different opinions on uh, whether or not uh, the way that, that I've shown you that diagram where everything was uh, like a separate function, whether that is the best approach or not. Um, pe people are actually thinking about, okay, uh, very much to your point, how should I bring that back together? I mean, are there things I should bring back right. together? Uh, so I absolutely let's, agree. Let's jump into uh, some, some, some Lambda action before you- I, I would be okay with that, yes. <laughs> All right. uh can, oh, you, can you like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. thank I you mean, sorry about that i took i took yeah i took this out show us our show our beautiful faces right. I, I was gonna say as much as i think that people really want to look at us i think this you know screen part is is probably interesting more interesting yeah. by the way if i'm wrong then just just let me know in the comments but uh, yeah, but yeah. Hey man, you're just asking for it huh? <laughs> i know i know that, that that was not a smart move i okay uh, so we, uh, we we talked a bit about about Pulumi that that allows me to essentially write my uh, my deployment script, if you will, in exactly the same language. Um, so for for me, that's uh, that's Go. So let me go into uh, into that folder. Um, While you're doing that, I just want to touch base on on what Pulumi is real quick. So Pulumi oh, is yeah. a structure as code, uh, uh, the product utility. Um, and it enables you to do things on uh, cloud providers, right? So you want to, it knows how to talk to AWS's APIs. It knows how to talk to Azure's APIs, uh, GCP's APIs, right? So that you can yeah. codify your infrastructure instead of going into the dashboard and spending like a half an hour pointing and clicking and, and creating things. You can just write it all in code and then submit it right, uh, right up yeah. to the API and it'll take care of it and track it for you, by the way. So like it keeps a state sure. of all that stuff you create. Just real quick, wanted to touch base there. I, I just did a webinar with them like like Monday, and it was a cool project that we nice. worked on. So Pulumi is a is nice. a is a fairly new tool, but it's really hot. And one of the differences with this the Pulumi tool is that, like like Leon said, uh, other tools you have to use like a domain specific language, uh, which is um, just again another language you have to learn, right? Uh, whereas using Pulumi, you just it's just like an SDK that you know if you're used to writing code and uh, learning SDKs is just another way to, 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 to yeah, write that infrastructure in code. So go ahead, sir. Yeah. yeah, no, no, absolutely. I mean, one of the one of the things I absolutely love, um, which isn't necessarily part of, uh, of of this deployment specifically, but it allows you to use all the constructs that you would do in like normal programming. So if I want to have a for loop, a if statement, stuff like that, it just it just makes it easier and. For, for me, uh, the less things I have to understand, the easier it is and the more value I can add to, uh, to, to well, in this case, the Acme, uh, Acme Fitness branch. Um, and, you know, we, we could also, um, with Pulumi though, having that the capability for, um, uh, you know, leveraging SDKs in the language of, of, of your choice, uh, what, one other concept that we were talking about on that webinar Monday was, uh, basically doing a uh, environmental test. So uh, we were using like PyTest to test, you know, make, make unit tests for the infrastructure. So when you were using, when in the example is, you know, you, you start up like some servers or some services, and then you want to test to make sure like they're validate their configuration. You could write unit tests, leverage Pulumi to, you know, and, and it's all the same code, right? You don't have to, jump in and out, jump through hoops like other products uh, to do that. So yeah. I just wanted to point that out that, you know, using that that system, Pulumi uh, tooling, uh, yeah, you could do well. The, the basically it opens up all the all the capabilities that you had before, right? Uh, yeah. To you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in my case, what I did is, and uh, I'll, I'll sort of walk you through the, uh, the, the details about what it's, yeah. what it's going to do, um, is I created the, uh, 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 the, the the zip file that you upload to in this case uh, in this case lambda so you can actually see what the uh, the output string is going to be 
Uh, and this, uh, this is one of the nice things that I, I, I agree with you. Uh, it gives you so much flexibility uh, when using tools like this that you can actually uh, uh, create tests on how should this work? What should this be? And because they, uh, they leverage state, they can also see what has changed and, and what hasn't. So that if something hasn't changed, it's not going to update it, uh, which is actually super nice. Uh, so I'm just going to hit uh, yes, and it's, it's going to update a bunch of stuff for me. And let me find real quick my, uh, my AW, ah, there it is. My AWS console, I'll go to, uh, to Lambda. Uh, and yes, I need to, uh, to, to blow this up a bit. So right now uh, it's it's deploying. I obviously did this one uh, one last night. So as soon as the deployment's ready, you actually see the last modified date uh, they changed, and everything yes has been taken care of for me. So it created the uh, the, the payment for me. It uh, it added the SQS triggers. Everything was uh, was done automatically. So if I wanted to test it, it would be as simple as going in here to uh, configure test event. Um, and actually, let me quickly look what uh, what my test cases were, because it, it actually matters in this case, because I, I want to make sure that uh, that I, I actually have something that uh, that works to do. Actually, you know what? We'll we'll look at it uh, how how what the output is once we get to uh, to the, the more Kubernetes side of things. Um, so it, it essentially takes care of everything for me that uh, that I need to do, uh, which is which is nice. However, as, uh, as you said, there are definitely reasons where, uh, where you want to have a little more control, where you want to have a little, more, uh, uh, a little more flexibility, where you might have done a massive investment in, uh, in on-prem hardware, um, where you want to leverage things like, uh, like Kubernetes. So what we'll, what we'll do, uh, and uh, Angel, you get to choose between OpenFAS or Knative. Um, We'll actually do something very similar like this. So I'll, I'll go spin up a, uh, a cluster on, on my machine using uh, using Kind, Kubernetes, and Docker, uh, and then we'll set up the uh, the entire stack deploying app. So which which would you prefer? Yeah, I mean we we already mentioned Knative, so let's just go with that, right? And then let's let's go to Knative in that case. Do something locally on your machine, yeah. This is this is going to be all locally in my machine. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So. Okay, and uh, let me let me grab my notes so that I do the right things in the right order. Uh, oh man, they gave yourself away. <laughs> well, look, I mean, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be completely honest here, uh, you know, easy. because Talk to me. Yeah. so I have a uh, uh, I have kind running. Uh, I think it's the uh, the latest version on the, on the screen there. Just to... oh yeah. Kind of hide the rest. It's kind of destroyed. There you go. Nice. Actually, let me do it like this so that you don't get the sort of bleeding uh, through. Uh, so I have a kind version uh, 0, uh, 081, which is uh, one of the latest versions. So I'm I'm going to create a, a Kubernetes cluster, and I'm essentially going to do uh, two things. So using like this uh, this cluster config. What I'm going to do is uh, uh, expose a bunch of ports to uh, to my host. So I'm going to expose port uh, 31380 and 31443, so basically an HTTP and an HTTPS port, so that I can later on actually use that within uh, uh, within my Kubernetes cluster. Does does that make sense? Yeah, uh, cool. and you could also, but you could also use uh, Pulumi to do that as well, right? Like, uh, you could absolutely use Pulumi to do that as well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Let me just do this right. slightly. So you're using basically the the pure Kubernetes way where you're creating a YAML file and a yes. manifest for, for basically configuring um, yeah, the container and how you want it to run. Yep. Yep. Ab absolutely. So uh, if I do oh, if I do cat oh. Cluster config. So th this is this is essentially it. This basically describes what my cluster is going to look like. So let me actually uh, actually go create one, and in my case that is 
create cluster with the name K native uh, with that specific configuration. Um, and that's that's essentially going to take a few seconds, which um, which actually brings me to, and I'm going to make my screen slightly smaller because I, I have something cool to uh, to uh, show you. Yeah, that's fine. Um, as this is starting up, uh, let me go to my downloads folder to a tool called Octant. And uh, essentially what I'm typing here isn't as relevant. Uh, what I'm about to show you in the UI is way more awesome. Um, can you zoom in on that so we can see? Oh, okay. Good. So this is this is not as interesting because this is essentially just uh, the uh, the output. But let me bring over this screen. So right now I can see the. Actually, let me blow that up a bit as well so that it's slightly more clear. Right now I can see everything that is going on in my uh, in my Kubernetes cluster, which is which is super nice. Because the, the amount of tools, the amount of stuff that you deploy to uh, to Kubernetes is, uh, is is massive. So having like a one place where, as a developer, you can uh, and this this is the cool part where you can not only look at the things that uh, that you're deploying, but where you can also uh, like update them and, and troubleshoot. That to me is massively cool. Uh, it's it's one of the projects that uh, that originated out of. Uh, uh, out of Heptio, which is which is now part of uh, part of VMware and, and completely open source, by the way. So that's that's something that uh, at least I I'm always fascinated about. So, so I can is, I can. This is like a GUI kind of interface wrapper for for the Kubernetes APIs, right? So you can yep. point it to if it's GCP, right? You could point it to that uh, and. And well, any basically any Kubernetes, because at the end of the day, underneath all of those things are just uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So it basically looks at my uh, cube config file, and I have uh, uh, two clusters, one running in, in GKE, as, as you can see by this prefix, and uh, the one that I just created with uh, with Kind, um, mm -hmm. and basically it, it allows me to uh, to look at both, and it has a dark uh, light and dark uh, UI, so that's that's kind of nice. Yeah, yeah. So, wow, that's yeah. I, I'm not a. I mean, I'm a big fan of of GUIs as da or dashboards, I should say, just to see right visually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When when configuring things, always in code, right? Like. <laughs> I I absolutely agree with that. So you know, let's let's actually apply a bunch of uh, a, a bunch of YAML files uh, simply because we can. So uh, this is essentially going to apply the uh, the CRDs for the uh, serving component. Uh, of uh, of Knative and the, the server component essentially takes care of like the HTTP interface and making sure that it can scale down to uh, to zero again. Um, and as we do that, those are now in the uh, uh, in the API server. So let's also apply the actual core stuff. Uh, and this is going to spin up a bunch of. Uh, uh, a bunch of extensions. It's going to create a bunch of um, config maps, stuff like that, and ultimately, it's going to create a bunch of uh, uh, of pods, a bunch of containers running on uh, on our cluster. Yeah. So, so the this cool thing is like if running in the control plane, right? So these are services that you're basically telling Kubernetes for the Knative framework, right? Yeah. Hey, this is uh, basically how I want you to deploy Knative on this cluster. So let's take a step back. We created a cluster. The first thing we did was create that cluster using that manifest uh, that yep. you did earlier, right? In the kind system. Then you spun up Octant. Is that running as is that running in that Kubernetes cluster as well, or is it running in a separate process? Or it's that is actually running in a separate process. And I mean, the reason that it runs there has to do with security. Um, I mean, if you if you would deploy something that uh, that can change the way your applications behave and the, the way that your applications are configured and deploy that to your cluster, right. that's that's going to be a security issue. Well, so you want you want no, so like basically you're running that octant as a binary outside of time, yeah. right? Is what I'm trying to get at, right? So yeah, absolutely, service it would be like any other right web service. You spin it up in its own kind of environment, VPC, whatever, yeah. and have access to the Kubernetes cluster. Just trying yeah. to make sure everybody kind of understands, um, uh, you know, the, the, the infrastructure or the uh, 
you know, the, uh, the the architecture, I should say. Yeah, no, that so, that, that, that makes sense. sense. The pieces for for K native uh, configured in the control plane in the Kubernetes uh, brains, because I that's what I call it. The control plane is the actual Kubernetes cluster, right? Is is uh, the, what actually controls all the services and orchestrates things is the cluster, and then the service the core services within that. You're basically adding another service into the control plane that's going to then be kind of uh, aware of what's happening in the cluster, and then Kubernetes, uh, the control plane can control that K-native service, yep. right? And then yep. being that it's Kubernetes, you're deploying K-native into actual pods or containers, the groupings of containers. Uh, so that's kind of how it flows into, uh, for yep. those that, folks that don't understand it. Uh, which it can be, that's why I tell people, Kubernetes is very complex and robust <laughs> and can take a while to to grasp like how things tie together. It's not your conventional uh, app t app and tier uh, architecture. It's it's something you, you have to learn, yes. And I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate enough, I get to work with a bunch of amazing folks that, that can help me figure out what are the things that uh, that I need to do. I'm definitely no <laughs> Kubernetes expert. <laughs> you get paid to learn it. That's a big deal. I mean, you know, that's kind of like uh, folks, yeah. folks that are, you know, interested and stuff. It's really hard. And I, yeah, even I struggle occasionally sometimes in the beginning, right, to see how these architectures form. But if you have a solid understanding of the fundamentals of the Kubernetes platform, then true. it makes it a little easier. True. Very true. Um, yeah. So as you can see uh, right now, there are uh, a bunch of pods running. So a bunch of bunch of different apps all have a, uh, a really descriptive name about what they're doing. Uh, for example, Autoscaler, as the name implies, will automatically scale your. Uh... Wait, who who says I'm a Kubernetes expert? I think uh, our friend is. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. <laughs> What's it mean? Like? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so the auto scanner essentially takes care of uh, uh, scaling up and down. Uh, the uh, the webhook uh, makes sure that as we're sending requests into uh, into the cluster, that it validates whether or not I'm I'm allowed to do that, uh, what I want to do, and, and things like that. Can um, I ask? So it's is is the webhook into the control plane or is it into K native? The webhook runs on the control plane. So the control plane essentially runs a bunch of services, webhook and controller, actually all of them, uh, that make sure that uh, the, the Kubernetes framework of services understand what needs to be done. Uh, so webhook is essentially the HTTP interface that you talk to in order to, uh, in order to deploy stuff. But what I'm saying is that webhook, though, is is tied to K native? Yes. Right. Not not actual Kubernetes. Like I'm saying that you're not the web hooking into Kubernetes services directly. You're web hooking into the K native services that are running on this Kubernetes platform, right? I'm I'm letting uh, K native take care of, of the, the the hard pieces for me. Yes. Right, right, right. And I just wanted to be clear because it, it, it for me, it, it, by the way, this is the first time I'm seeing this. So it was just uh, not confusing, but I, I could see where people might get confused, like that, you yep. know, web hooking into Kubernetes. So I want everyone to kind of stop there, think about uh, this as we're just dealing with K native now, because you deployed K native. Now we're only dealing with those services on that cluster, right? So yep. the thing is, we're, we're, saying, we're saying cluster, but is it the K-native cluster or the Kubernetes cluster? They are two different things, right? <laughs> Even though they live in the same place. Yep. All right. So K-native cluster, webhooks, go. <laughs> okay, cool. So let me actually go back to, uh, to to my terminal. And there is one, well, there are two extra files here, and we'll, we'll touch on okay. both. But for now, I... Uh, I actually see, and I'm I'm going to use Nano because I I otherwise will never quit if I use you know things like VI. Oh come uh, on, jump in VI. I got you. I'll, I'll give you. A <laughs> so, okay, you know what? You know what? If if you got my back, I'll I'll do it. I got your back. Always got your back. Man. So we're All we're right. in VI. All right. Oh, this. 
And I, I, I can just use the arrow buttons, right? Yeah, you can yeah. go, yep. And then when you want to type, just type the I, Col uh, just type the I key and it will insert and then that will let you type. And then escape key will put you in read only mode. So, okay. Does that okay. make sense? It, it, it does. So the, the, the two things that I wanted to uh, to highlight, at least for now, is um, uh, actually, let me let me take one step back. I didn't explain what uh, what courier is. Um, essentially, when when you want to get traffic into your Kubernetes cluster, uh, you need to have what they call an ingress provider. So basically, ingress makes sure that traffic from from outside um is is like collected in in one place uh, maybe one cord or one load balancer and then distributed to where in the cluster it actually needs to be uh for me i've chosen courier uh, simply because that uses the least amount of uh, of additional resources when uh, when you look at uh, at different ingress providers um i could have done something like istio i could have done something like nginx uh, this is just the one that that i chose um if you're more comfortable choosing any of the others by all means, please go do so. Um, and then also, if you're if you're running in the cloud provider, they may not be available to you, right? I mean, I guess you could spin up, but you would probably leverage something like uh, who, uh, what do you call it, Elastic uh, yeah. uh, Load Balancer on, on Amazon or one of their um, services for uh, load balancers on GCP or whatever. Uh, but yeah, this is again, you're just configuring Kubernetes to configure your your uh, k-native instances right and yep i mean to, to be fair to uh, to gcp which i think has an incredibly slick experience uh, oh, they yeah. take care of that for you it's literally one checkbox that says uh, when i yep. spin up kubernetes uh, also add istio as my default ingress controller right. uh, which is actually super nice but i'm glad you um, brought a courier because i was going to ask <laughs> yeah. so Cool. So it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a load balancer. It's uh, it's an ingress service. Uh, load balancer actually has a very specific oh. meaning in, in yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. That's true. But right. Yeah, which which I definitely had to learn as well and sort of wrap my uh, my my brain around. Um, so uh, do, 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 do. Ah. so this is this is a type load balancer, which is which is okay. And then uh, there are two node ports in here. Uh, one that, uh, uh, well, because we'll update this later, one that says node port 31443 and one that says node port 31080. And these are the two ports that we configured in that, uh, that cluster config earlier on. So what I'm essentially doing is I'm tying the ports for the, uh, the courier gateway, uh, the, the ones that you see noted by target port, I'm actually binding them to a, a node port so that my uh, my node my Kubernetes node is um, is able to understand what uh, what what should be happening. So as as soon as traffic comes on like port three uh, three one zero eight zero, it will automatically direct it to uh, uh, to this target port, which is which is actually kind of nice. Yeah, so it, that's a, those features are are the target and and node ports are. Basically, like a network address translations, but for routing uh, traffic through ports, right? Because obviously, yeah. you can't have a, a system with the same IP address on the same interface, but you can do it with different ports. It's just port forwarding. So if you have a router at home or something, yeah, it's similar to that concept where you know you you ingress, which you're you're sending traffic to uh, port 80, and then on the back end, Kubernetes knows, all right, this is traffic for this. Uh, K-native K application sends it right to 31080, uh, which is yep. again, one of the beauties of, uh, of Kubernetes and that, that platform is you don't have to really worry about it. It's kind of baked in. You just have to configure the little bits, right? That you want to happen. Yeah. Sp speaking of little bits, one of the things I, uh, I need to do right now is change the uh, type from a load balancer to node port. Um, so you said I should press I, right? I, yeah, you'll see the insert. Whenever you see that little insert, that, that okay. means you can edit, right? Okay. And then I can just use delete to, oh. Yeah. All right. I'm getting a master class. That's the only change you need to make? Yes. All right, then hit escape. Okay. dokie. And now you're in read-only mode, right? Uh-huh. So now you can't edit anything now. Now okay. you want to save it, right? Yes, please. 
so colon and then uh, W Q lowercase and then enter. It's right quit. Boom. Ah. Done. Okay, so if I now do cat. It's there, uh, man. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I, I trust you. I just want to. Oh, I know. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> uh, two, 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 two. Oh, yeah. This is awesome. I'm learning as we speak. Thank you very much. Oh, that's why I wanted you to jump in the Vim to show someone else. Maybe they're like, oh, I don't know this Vim thing. They're, yeah, that, that's just a little taste, but yeah. And if you wanted to, like, let's say you make some changes and you don't want to save them, you just escape out, right? Get out of the, the mm -hmm. edit mode. And then just to uh, colon Q bang, and that will uh, exclamation point that will quit without save, right? So there you go. So remember, That's quit right point. is or right quit. I'm sorry, right quit is W Q is your saving. Okay. Point. All right. Yes. So now that we fixed that, uh, let's actually go apply the uh, uh, the stuff so that it's going to create all the things I need. And um, it, uh, it actually created a Curry Assistant namespace. So if we go back to, uh, to Octant here, I should now have a Curry Assistant namespace that uh, is going to show me everything that's, uh, that's going on. So it's going to create a bunch of pods. It's going to create a bunch of other things as well. And the nice thing is uh, if we go to the uh, the gateway, the one that we uh, we just configured, it's actually right. going to show me all the stuff that uh, that is going on underneath. And that's actually pretty, uh, pretty awesome. So, um, so we will. Once things come online, they're going to turn green or is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Nice. That's pretty cool, man. I, I, I don't even know about the Octon project, so I'm going to check that out. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you if you're more comfortable doing things in uh, in in like a, a text based thing, there's also this amazing and I'll, I'll blow it up here a bit because yeah. this is all, all in, in terminal. There is this project called K9S. Oh, I know I heard about this. I haven't used it, but I heard about it. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, right. this is this is legit awesome. I mean, basically right. the same things just in uh, in in a text based uh, text based window. So they like aggregated all the kubectl stuff and, and serve yeah. up this uh, standard out. That's nice. That's yep. Cool. Uh, so if I go back here, you you can see oh you can see everything is uh, everything is green now, um, and we uh, we updated the uh, the service and you can see that that one is okay. And if I click on it, it will actually take me to like a representation of that service. So you can actually see here that uh, those ports are are in here 31080 31443 um, which is which is actually pretty awesome considering everything that I see here I could actually go in and and edit as well. Uh, obviously that's not something you want to do in production but you know we're we're testing locally so that's that's totally okay. I don't think you would want to run this in production either to be fair. Yeah, right? prob probably not. <laughs> But because I don't even see any like uh, security <laughs> uh, permissions or anything, you're you're just running off of the kubectl uh, access, right? Exactly. So everything I can do, Octant can do. Uh, right. Obviously, if I have less access to, uh, to to my cluster, then Octant can do less things. Yeah. No, but I mean, even with that, right? Like it's uh, anyway. Oh yeah. It's a great dev dev tool. Maybe even. Uh, Visual it's tool. an amazing deck tool. Absolutely, absolutely. So now the only thing I need to do, uh, actually there are two things I need to do. First thing is I need to tell Knative that uh, it should use Courier for the ingress control. Uh, and that is like this uh, this thing that I'm doing. Now I'm going to patch the uh, config network in, uh, in Knative serving, and I'm going to add a, a thing in there that makes sure that the ingress comes from courier.ingress.networking.kdative.dev. Right. The, the type is a, is a merge. Uh, so it's telling K Kubernetes to uh, either replace, or well, using the patch. So it'll replace that object, right, that lives in. in it's yes. Yes. The, it, will actually, it will actually merge what is here in patch with the existing stuff uh, that is there already. Right. Gotcha. And uh, the second uh, uh, second config map that uh, that I need to patch. Let me actually paste this already in there. 
that is the config domain and that is essentially the default domain that um, in this case kubernetes or the k native is going to show uh, when it comes to the uh, the urls um, and because i'm running everything locally i want to make sure that uh, the url is available locally and for that i'm using a uh, a magic dns uh, which is nip.io there's also one called uh, xip uh, xip.io and essentially everything before the uh, uh, domain name, so in this case, 127.001, um, is automatically returned as the DNS entry for the lookup. So that's, that's actually super nice. That means that I can run everything locally and still do uh, like a, a DNS lookup. Well, you know what that stands for, right? No IP. Yeah, I should. <laughs> huh. I actually, I didn't know that. <laughs> Oh, that actually makes sense. Nice. I think they used to, anyway, yeah, but sorry. I, I also did tons of, uh, what do you call it? Uh, yeah, hosting, web hosting back in the day. So nice. <laughs> companies are, yeah, it's pretty amazing. You have these services that offer, like back in the day with mad hacks with like ARPA tables. And so yeah. anyway, keep going, sorry. No, this is awesome, man. I'm, I'm, I'm learning a lot here, which is, which is great. Um, so right now, we pretty much have configured our, our complete cluster. Uh, Knative is up and running. Uh, obviously, Kubernetes is up and running. There is a, uh, an ingress gateway. So right now, this, this is like stuff that a, a uh, traditional uh, platform operations team would take care of. So right now, I'm like at the level that as a developer, I can start to do things. Um, so, because I'm a developer, let's actually go uh, go deploy an application, and I'm going to use the same application that uh, that, that we just looked at. Um, so I, I can I stop you real quick. That's a good yeah. point to like make though. Is all of these things that you just did, you know, from when you showed the application uh, and then started configuring um, kinds uh, your Kubernetes cluster, and then so all of these things. What he just did was created. Uh, an instance of Knative, which is the serverless uh, framework, right? So, so yes, everything that. So let's back it up here. So, AWS provides this service called Lambda. You saw how you know Leon built uh, his his uh, Lambda application, or at least you saw the architecture of it, and then how all the things and he had to go through to package it and then you know deploy. What, he, what we just did up until this point is literally stand up a Kubernetes cluster, configure it to run Knative, and then we configure Knative <laughs> to be able to uh, serve up the next piece, which is taking that same application and being able to package it up into a Knative uh, format. Am I missing something? Uh, no, that's, that's essentially where we are right. at right now. I just wanted to kind of recap because it was a lot of stuff going on. And true, very true. Thank you. There, there are people watching who, again, right, this is, and, and who are going to watch this because it's being recorded, who are going to be like, oh, wow, what is going on here? So I like yeah. to stop in between, especially when it's like, you know, a lot of things going on. Because uh, normally my demos, I already have it pre baked, you know, I don't, you know, bog them down with the, the, these details. But it's good for folks to understand why. Uh, I give talks like, hey, uh, one of my talk titles is, hey, uh, you want a Kubernetes, you must know Docker. Or, you know, it's almost like a series that I do where, like, you want a Kubernetes, you must know networking, you must know infrastructure as code, right? These are kind of the skills that uh, I know I needed when I started with Kubernetes. Luckily, I had most of them, but there was some like, that I was lacking in, like uh, maybe networking uh, was a little kind of out of touch with because I haven't really, you know, played in that space. but doesn't take me long to ramp up. And folks need to understand that, you know, outside of just regular code, there are many different um, uh, aspects of, of technology or, or, yeah, IT, I guess we could call it IT, mm -hmm. uh, that you should have under your belt before you even jump into Kubernetes, at least a, a fundamental understanding. Uh, so sorry, I just wanted to kind of like stop there, catch everybody up, level set. 
So the next moving forward, we're going to take that application now, or you're going to take that application yes. and deploy it to this newly, fresh, newly minted, deployed uh, K-native cluster, right? On yes. Kubernetes. Yes. So right. let me, let me before we, before I just apply the, uh, the YAML file, let me actually go yeah. into the code just once more to like go over what, uh, what it's going to do and, and sort of yeah. see a few differences between what it looks like in uh, in AWS, what we or or Lambda, what we looked at uh, at the beginning, and uh, some of the the differences uh, that that are in here right now. So, I, I essentially built this this application to run on uh, on Cloud Run, which is as uh, as we talked about a little earlier in uh, in this session, the uh, the hosted version of uh, of, of Knative. Um, and on granted, <laughs> sorry? On Google Cloud, right? On Google Cloud, yeah. Uh, I, right. I was going to say, and granted, Google did an amazing job making that experience as easy as, uh, as possible. Um, so total kudos to, uh, to them for that. And essentially what it's, what, what it's going to do is it's going to spin up a, uh, a server running on, uh, on port 8080 and uh, basically handle the validation request of uh, uh, of a, a credit card, and because it uh, because it's it's Kubernetes as as you said, if you want to know Kubernetes, you need to know Docker. Uh, I, I think that was the title of your talk. Um, so the the thing I, I need to do is I need I need to build a Docker container out of it. Uh, so I I created this uh, uh, this this Docker file already. Um, essentially, I, cr I created the container as well so that we don't have to wait for Go to completely compile. Uh, that would take a, a, take a few minutes. And I mean, nobody's essentially sitting around waiting for, uh, for things to compile, um, I think, so, I hope. Yeah, make a point here. So unlike uh, this is so this Docker file, Docker image that we're going to build, that you built off of this Docker file is yeah. equivalent to that Lambda payment SQS zip, right? So you've yes. taken your application and you've packaged it up because of Amazon's uh, Amazon Lambda's uh, requirements, right? You've taken that application, you've packaged it in the manner that uh, Lambda expects, which is a zip file with all the accoutrement, right? And then yep. um, you push that up and run certain parameters in the CLI or in Pulumi that that was the example you used. Um, yep. What we're doing here is um, cloud native, big difference, right? Big difference. Uh, cloud native is saying, all right, we are going to take your application as packaged in a Docker container, which is also really, really awesome. And the reason is you can create these lightweight services uh, and you don't have to change your, your workflow, right? So that's one thing I like yep. about the K native concept is I don't have to change what I'm currently doing because most of us are not deploying applications the way uh, Lambda wants you to, right? We're deploying applications and packaging them up, or uh, not deploying, but depackaging them up in a in a Docker centric in a container centric world, right? So that that's really one of the, for me at least, one of the uh, kind of um, I want to say uh, reasons why I would lean towards uh, K Native, you know, because I mean, let's face it, uh, having to package things up in a certain way to get it working on a, that, that, that's, 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 again, some more vendor lock-in that I don't really like personally. You know, I, I think, um, you know, some of these providers should be rethinking their deployments uh, to kind of, you know, make it, make our lives easier as developers and we don't have to jump through hoops to get the same damn app up on a different service, right? Anyway, yep. that's what Docker is there for, is to kind of level the playing field. But go ahead. I'm sorry. I just want to make that point. No, I, th I think you're absolutely right. And I'll actually go one, one step further. I mean, the, the, whole, the whole reason why I love uh, Knative so much is that when I, when I built all this, I actually ran everything as just independent uh, uh, Docker containers, even before deploying stuff to, uh, uh, to Kubernetes. And, um, from like the step from creating this uh, this Docker or doing a Docker build with uh, with this Docker file up to uh, uh, applying the uh, the YAML, what I'll show you in a second, is 
I mean, it's literally just writing that uh, uh, that that deployment file, and there's there's nothing I need to do in my code or something um, if I want to run this as a standalone Docker container. I I could literally take this one and run it um, maybe on like a, a Raspberry Pi, for example. I mean, maybe running a payment service on a Raspberry Pi, not the best example, but you, you get the idea. But that's the whole point, right? So your Docker is designed, as long as you can have that Docker runtime running in your host system, yeah. you can run this application with very little. I mean, sometimes there are some nuances uh, from the container, you know, the way that it runs on the host. But for the most part, what you're doing is isolating that application and you're leveraging a very lightweight dependencies. So you're not, unlike a VM, I know you work for VMware and VMware, awesome company, uh, awesome you know thing uh, or platforms and stuff for virtualization, but this is not straight up virtualization. This is um, a, an efficient way, right? To leverage existing, um, underlying existing resource management tooling like uh, C groups, uh, zones and different Solaris, right? So Docker is not a hypervisor per se, right? It's a it's a runtime sure. that lever that knows how to access those uh, C group underlying host C group or APIs and, and then leverage them so that you know you don't have to package uh, the whole OS into a, a, a VM image, right? And then a hypervisor has to do all that translation and management for you. I uh, just yeah. want to kind of put that difference out there. Um, and then again. Um, with one thing I, I didn't like about lambdas was you have to start their the application a certain way right so like now you have you can see it right there you have two separate the same code but you have it in separate folders now of course you could probably build a module and then call that module inside of your lambda but at the end of the day why should you have to do that when right docker container docker image is the way to go um true yeah so Sorry. I mean that's essentially Sorry. like what, what's oh. going on here. Yeah. Yeah. So continue. <laughs> Sorry. Let's do some code. Exactly. So um, let me. Uh, you know what? I'll just vi into the uh, the service YAML because I just learned that. Um, so essentially, what I'm doing here is uh, I'm configuring a bunch of uh, a, a bunch or one container is going to be deployed. It's going to have a name called Payment Go. Um, it uses that specific uh, specific container here, and uh, it has a bunch of uh, variables that uh, that I need. Uh, rather than actually sending all the data to uh, uh, to a, a tool called Wavefront, uh, which is like an observability tool, I'm just letting it uh, uh, deploy all uh, all locally. So if I don't want to, I just do Q exclamation mark, right? Can I stop you right there and ask you about yeah. Wavefront real quick? Like a really sure. thirty can't like quick thing about rate for instance you mentioned it whenever you mention technology in front of me i have to have you uh explain it like 30 second pitch whatever uh of what wavefront is uh, since you sure. mentioned it okay so wavefront is a uh an application from uh, from vmware which helps you understand what uh, uh what what is going on within your ecosystem so it's it's an observability tool where you can send your your metrics, where you can send your uh, your, your traces uh, of of applications, where you can send uh, logs as well. And essentially, from a uh, developer or operator point of view, you can see what's uh, what's going on. And that's that's obviously a lot more useful than having to uh, having to browse a bunch of log files. Um, so a, a demo I, I usually do when I talk about uh, about Wavefront is running a, a performance test on uh, on a bunch of a bunch of containers that then emit metrics like um, uh, how long did it take uh, was it was it a successful run or not and then within Wavefront I can visualize that in in a bunch of charts so that I can say you know what uh, over the whole it took like 200 milliseconds I'm just making this up um to uh, to complete a single run or um if uh, i've i've seen like 50,000 failures here so maybe something is wrong in my code or uh, you know along those lines yeah thank you cool um so that that's essentially the service and that docker container that i mentioned in there was the docker container that uh, that that i've built from the uh, the service that we uh, that we just looked at 
So I'm going to uh, CTL apply. And instead of courier YAML, I'm going to do service YAML. And uh, that's going to uh, create the, uh, uh, the surface. Um, it's it's going to take a bit of time to make sure that everything is OK. And because this is the only thing I do from a developer point of view, in order to let Kubernetes uh, expose that service as an actual endpoint so that I can use the, uh, uh, the courier ingress gateway that, uh, that we looked at just now, um, underneath the covers, Knative is actually going to make sure that everything is wired up correctly, that everything is routed uh, the way that, uh, that, that it should. So instead of having to do all of that myself, which I mean, I, I could have if I, if, I, uh, if I actually knew how to do it, um, Knative takes away or abstracts all of that, uh, that, that difficult work for me, which is one of the reasons I, I like Knative so much. So let's go back into uh, into Octant. And if everything went well, we should be able to see, ah, there it is. We should be able to see a bunch of different things uh, going on here. Uh, we can see the service. We can see uh, the, uh, the networking and, and stuff like that being created, um, which is, again, one of the reasons I, I like Octant, because it just visualizes everything that uh, that, that is going on. So if I click on that, it will actually show me everything I need to know uh, in order to be able to uh, uh, to see what, uh, what what was going on. I could absolutely do that from a uh, command line point of view as well. I can do a cube CTL get K S V C, and that is essentially going to get my uh, all of my my uh, my services, all of my K native services, I should say. Right. Um, and uh, so it created the uh, the one called Payment Go, uh, which is the name I gave it within uh, within my YAML. It uh, it created a URL for me that uh, that I can call, and as you can see, it added the one two seven zero zero one dot dot nip dot io, which I just learned means no IP. Um, and uh, essentially, as soon as I send traffic to uh, to that URL, uh, obviously from from my local machine it will hit that uh, that specific endpoint. Does that, does that still make sense? Absolutely. Cool. So let me find my super awesome testing tool. I, uh, I use this great tool called Insomnia, which, uh, which is super useful when it, uh, when it comes to uh, like sending, uh, sending a bunch of, uh, of tests. Um, Sending sending things to a, a REST endpoint. So what I'll do is actually you just saw the uh, the JSON that uh, that I was going to send. And one of the amazing things, at least for me, amazing things is that I can actually do copy as curl, and uh, then it will from uh, from the uh, the URL and, and everything that was in there. And let me just copy this real quick it will actually create the entire curl invocation for me. So copy as curl. If I paste that here, oh, isn't that awesome? So uh, what it's going to do now, as soon as I hit enter, actually, let me just go, uh, go, go do that. Not found, nice. Okay, probably I have to debug something there. Uh, but what it, uh, what it should be doing is essentially sending a request there, making sure that uh, the card details are, uh, are OK, and then coming back saying, hey, this was OK, this was not OK. It could be that um, the DNS didn't update yet. Actually, that, that could totally be as well. Uh, so that's, I'll, I'll, I'll check that out later. I'll, I'll, post, a, I'll post a thing on, uh, uh, on, uh, on Twitter as, as soon as I, uh, I'll, I'll create a short video out of it. It's no worries, man. We we always uh, right like <laughs> these things. That's, but I, I'm oh, I know. assuming if you're interfacing a service, your local machine hasn't picked up the. That's the yeah, exactly. That's that's yeah. probably yeah. what's uh, what's going on. And so if I it, uh, flushes, you could you could probably do a flush. But anyway, keep keep going. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, in essentially the same way that I, I deployed it here, I could deploy it to a uh, 
uh, to a, a Kubernetes cluster essentially anywhere. Uh, um, I could I could target a, a GCP cluster on a, on a Google Cloud cluster and, and essentially use the exact same application with the exact same parameters. I could uh, go in and, and uh, create a cluster on uh, a Microsoft Azure or, or AWS and um, essentially deploy the exact same thing. So as, as you said, using something like, like Knative essentially gives me the, um, the, the flexibility to deploy wherever I want. Uh, and if you if you just looked at the screen as as I was talking, you saw that uh, that application sort of sort of disappear. Um, that's that's what the auto scaler does. So when we were looking at uh, the services in uh, in the K native serving namespace, there was this thing called auto scaler. Um, and right now, because the application wasn't used for a certain amount of time, the auto scaler says, you know what, no one's using it. I'll just remove it. So that the the resources on uh, on the Kubernetes cluster, uh, so that they can be used for other workloads, essentially making it making it easier for me to uh, to reuse stuff because that ultimately is uh, is is one of the important things here. Not only that, not only resource allocation, you're also diminishing your attack vector, right? So if the application doesn't live no hacker can or you know someone who's with malicious malicious intent can go ahead and pull your uh you know your your system uh obviously right if they pull it uh it will come up but it's just another layer right so why keep something yep. around uh that's like basically a, a potential window right a basement window that can be broken into uh so you know you got to think of those implications as well uh Back in the day, that was when I was a kid. That was my thing, finding little holes <laughs> where I can get myself in. I yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. So I, I always have that. In my a lot of my coworkers and friends are like, "Man, you just go right for the <laughs> for the break in, right?" Like so, yeah. <laughs> nice. No, nah, it's not nice, but it's just <laughs> very yeah. If you come to my house, my uh, my uh, Wi-Fi passwords are like. Through the roof, like my family's always yelling at me, like, oh, "Why so tough?" <laughs> anyway, yeah, people uh, let me out. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, so that at least for me, pretty much was was it what I what I kind of wanted to show and and make sure of that uh, that we walk through. So what we did is we looked at, uh, and let me just bring that oh bring that up one more time. We essentially looked at uh, de deploying a uh, a function to uh, to AWS and, and sort of how that works with uh, with Pulumi. Uh, we looked at uh, things that um, uh, we obviously looked at at Octon as you go into the more Kubernetes side of things. We uh, we looked at actually setting up that uh, that entire cluster, which is uh, from a uh, uh, from, from a local development point of view, actually really really nice. Um, if uh, if you want to like productize this, then you would obviously use a a cluster that's that's not running on on your machine. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, Angel, thank you so much for, uh, for for having me. Wait a minute, we got we got some time, so do we? Want to want to want to automate some of this stuff into a uh, cloud? Actually, if we if I we mean, can, can we? Yeah, I have time. I mean, we got like another half hour. So okay. don't go. Hey, buddy, I thought we were gonna. Yeah, I wanted. I would like to try to to okay. write a, an orb. Uh, maybe use the orb to deploy to some cloud run. Yeah. Oh, that. You know, I I like that idea. I mean, I, I haven't mean, done that. Yeah, that's all right. We'll we'll uh, we'll figure something out here in a, in, in a sec. Let me. Let's let's. Uh, should I? So I can just okay, want to switch to my screen and maybe I can try to yeah work absolutely. Work. Yeah, let's, what the hell, right? Um, so you made me a contributor on that GitHub project, right? Yes. All right. So let me see. Um, all right, first, let me get set up and then uh, I'll be happy that way. Uh, I don't need Go, right? Because I, like I told, I told Liana uh, this morning, I went ahead and uh, I bought a new machine and I was setting it up and I don't have any of my dev tools on here 
yet. That's going to be my little weekend uh, kind of project you know, under nice. COVID-19, you know, cut the grass and then work uh, installing on the dev tools back in this new machine. So what was the name of that again? Acme, right? Yeah, that was the uh, the Acme yeah. uh, serverless payment. Number one on my list. All right, cool, cool. Oh, thank you. Let me get rid. <laughs> let me get rid of this, uh, and I will share my screen in one second. So, all right, cool, cool. So let's do this. Um, yeah, I think I got a nice. Uh, all right, let me share now. So what I'm going to do is add my screen. Here we go. All right, share screen two. Can everybody see that nice? I think I think I can see it. If you well. if you blow it up slightly more, that awesome. that will be yeah. awesome. Yeah, now you can you tell me blow it up, blow it up. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right, cool, cool. So uh, so we got this thing in a Go image, which is awesome. Um, and then so this is well, wait a minute. So let's let's think about this. So you know we could do this. Um, a couple different ways. You have a Docker file in this project, I assume somewhere, right? And mm -hmm. uh, let's take a look at the CMD. So right, you have a Docker file here. Great. So I can take this, create an image, an image, and then we can push that up to Docker Hub. Cool. Yep. All right. Awesome. So first thing we want to do is let's set up all the good parts, which is um, Gonna jump over to Circle CI. And let's see, where's that? Okay, here we go. So I know I, I got something working here. Um, and all right, cool. So I need to find your project first and then add it to Circle CI. Oh, I love this. I'm getting a masterclass Circle CI from the master here. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, wait, we're already following because you already set it up. Right. Cool, cool, cool. So here we go. Uh, we set it up. You did that 29 names ago, not me. Wait, no, this is not the right project. Yeah, I was, I was going to say that. That is not me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are um, ba -ba -ba Regits. There we go. Or Ret, Ret Gits. What does that mean, by the way? I always wanted to. I always say Regits, but. <laughs> That's What's... my last name in reverse. <laughs> you reverse engineered your last name, and now it's yeah, exactly. Your... It's your handles. All right, nice. All right, I'm going to add this. Uh, cool, cool. So I'm going to follow the project. The, what, what's happening was uh, uh, Leon already kind of set this up in Circle CI, and what we what he did was when he set it up was uh, enable Circle CI to do webhooks uh, or monitor his his repo up in GitHub. So anytime his code changes, a a, a uh, Circle CI pipeline is triggered. Uh, and if you're asking yourself, like, what's a pipeline? Uh, this is a pipeline. And he did a CI skip because that's awesome uh, feature, by the way, right? So a lot of times when you want to make changes and you want to run something, right, and waste your minutes or waste resources, you would use CI skip. So in your commit statement. So if you didn't know that, um, CI skip is the, the kind of just write that in your text. It's a uh, bracket CI skip CI space skip, or you could do skip CI as well. It's you know either way, but as long as you have that, it will not run. So what we're going to do is I need to branch this out. So now that I have access, I'm going to jump back to my editor. And first thing I want to do, well actually, that's a that's another uh, mistake. I need to go to my terminal. Uh, oh, that's not good. Ah, <laughs> oh man, it just gave away all my good stuff. Uh, anyway, I'll just I'll change I'll be canceling out some stuff today. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter. All right, so let me do a uh, quick uh, yeah escape uh, quit thing. I'm always doing this, by the way. So now I got to do all the all the good things. All right, let's expose everything. Um, so let me do it clear. All right, so we're gonna do a git status just to see we're on master. What I like to do is get a branch, right? I don't like to work off a of master. It's, that's not good in my opinion. And wait, now we're going to do a git checkout of a new branch. And we're going to call this um, 
I don't know, uh, Rivera uh, test, just a whatever. And then FTP. So um, first thing we want to do is uh, now jump back over to the to the, uh, the Docker file to the repo, jump into your config. All right, we're not going to use Pulumi, right? So we don't really need to do that. Uh, but what we should do is look at the documentation for the cloud run stuff. That's for sure. So let's go here and um, uh, circle CI and uh, dot com. Sorry, that's uh, Forbes. Registry. And what we're going to look up is uh, Cloud Run. There we go. So, orbs, right? These are packaged up configurations. So, uh, you saw that YAML file that, that Leon was showing us a little earlier um, has a lot of things going on there. Uh, orbs are designed to make things easier for developers on their platform. And what I mean by that is it gives you the ability to kind of use some some person's work already right so it's almost like an npm package or a go module where you know you're leveraging it as a, like a library uh, i like to call it more of a, a yeah like a class right so um here's the cloud run orb uh basically we already have so leon already has um uh, the docker file which is great right and we know that it works because he deployed it uh, in in uh, now, th this doesn't have a GUI, right? It's just a service. Is that right? Yes. OK, that's great. So what we're going to do here is say um, uh, we can do build and deploy on manage. So this is, I believe, the Cloud Run Manage. That's the simple one, which goes to, let's do Cloud. Uh, I, haven't been, I haven't been in this Cloud Run space for a minute. So forgive me if I'm a little little rusty. Uh, but basically what I'm doing here is I'm going to the dreadful GUIs that I'm not a big fan of at all. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a command line person, but IDEs I'm okay with, but we'll just, all right, Cloud Run, here we go, cool. So um, this is where, you, so Cloud Run, right? This is what we were talking about. Um, Leon showed us earlier some of that uh, AWS Lambda magic, right? Where uh, you can go in and do all that, that goodness there. Uh, Cloud Run, same thing, right? So it's really simple. Uh, you would create a service, right? And if you click here, right, all you're really telling is, hey, where do you want it? Uh, and you could say like, you know, run it on Anthos, which I believe is a GKE cluster, which I'm not doing that. I just want to use leverage their service, right? And then, um, right, and then this is it, right? It gives you the ability to create a, a public um, opening or ingress, right, to, to this yep. service. Um, so, and yeah, then we just click next. So, right, service name, um, test. Uh, and then you select the container, right? So, like, we're not going to do that. We're going to grab, I think we should grab it from uh, Docker Hub. Let's see, you can do like, hey, the container port here, right? There's some details that you need to kind of tell the system, um, just like the, the uh, translation, right? So uh, the container port would be uh, 8080 or whatever whatever we, we need to, what, what, what was it that you have in your Docker file? Um, yeah, so basically um, it's a simple right thing and then you would just create it. We're gonna do that all in an orb which, which knows how to talk to the Google API. And then, um, so we're gonna cancel that one. So right now we have nothing, right? Hopefully with the changes that we make, we'll be able to do this. Uh, it does require a little bit of magic, but we also need to kind of view the, um, the org registry document. So let's go ahead and, um, oh wait, we can even build the Docker container. Oh, that's nice. So it's wow. been a minute since I played with this. Uh, but let's let's take a look. So we wanted to. Uh, we don't care about the GKE cluster stuff. Uh, we want to. Can you can you make it slightly bigger? Oh yeah, sure, absolutely. Thanks for reminding me. Oh, it might be too big, but how's that? Is that better? Yeah, thanks. All right, cool. 
So what we want to do is um, with orbs, right? They basically kind of tell you how to start using them. Uh, but basically, um, what we need to do is obviously grab this bit right here, uh, since we're going to use that in our code. Um, and I'll tell you what, we're just going to go ahead and yeah, paste all that nicely in here. And so now I've basically, it's almost like an include statement, right? I'm saying, hey, uh, actually, you know what, uh, Leon, I, I, I don't even need to do that. I could just do it like this where you can keep both of your, I don't want to mess up your thing. Just want to make an addition to your code, right? So even if you don't use that Pulumi or it's a list of things that we're going to use, right? And right, so we have our Circle CI uh, Cloud Run Orb now. Uh, we'll go back to the docs, and we're going to say, uh, "Here's a usage example." So what we could do is we could say, "Build and uh, yeah, we don't want to do that though. Build and deploy GKE. What we want to do is build on a manage. Here we go. So since we're going to do manage, right? Uh, this is how you would leverage the cloud build uh, piece, right? And it has the build command. So we could actually literally cut and paste all of this usage stuff. Uh, the only thing that we will need to do, well, wait a minute, let me think about this. So no, we don't need to do this. We need What we need to do is grab all of this and uh, da, 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 da. which one is this one, cloud deploy? And then run commands. Deployed mass servers could be verified for further tests. Okay, so yeah, you could do like a callback to that service. You know what I mean to see if it's up and running. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll do that manually for now. Um, so I just want to make sure that I got everything right. Cool, cool, cool. So it looks like uh, we'll just be able to create this job called build and deploy, and then we have a workflow. Okay, so it's real simple. Let's start with this little bit first, right? Uh, but the one thing that we will need to do is add a step to build our Docker file and stick it up into the cloud. So um, before we do that, I'm gonna just copy this back over to um, the system. And uh, where's my, there we go. So I'm going to, yeah, you don't have a, this is like a, a single stage job. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm not gonna remove anything here, Leon. I'm just gonna uh, comment it out for now. Okay. So that get it out of our way. Um, and we'll start from here. So hopefully we'll get this done. Uh, do you have a little bit, if we go over, get some time? I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have at least until like, uh, well, that's one one thirty my time, so that's. No, I mean like like a half an hour. Maybe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Yeah. If it, if, if if we get running great, not, uh, I can go over a little bit. Um, I just want to make sure you can too, right? <laughs> All right. Cool. Cool. So we have our Docker image, um, and then we have our our checkout, which is going to check out the code. Uh, what we actually need to do here is, um, yeah, we need to do a, I think a build step. So we have to build a Docker image based off of this code, right? So yes. I would say um, build uh, Docker image, right? Oh. This has a job, right? This is a job that we have to make. Uh, and then um, obviously we're gonna do Docker, and um, one of the things I wanted to do, though, as well, is basically grab some some other uh, bits to to actually do this uh, using what we call our uh, Docker in Docker building capabilities. So um, let me grab what what we need, which is I know that uh, I'm going to need some of this stuff here. I already kind of have it. I don't want to type all this stuff in if I already have it. But basically, what I need to do here is finish this uh, thing, which is the executor, right? So we're saying we're going to build this on Docker. And then we need to, whenever you build something on Docker, you have to provide it an image, right? So we're going to do an image of, um, I think we can use the same. 
ah, you know what? I'm going to use, uh, just for shits and giggles, I'm going to use the uh, the uh, Circle CI node one. And the reason is it doesn't really matter uh, what which image you use, but I'm just trying to show off that there's we have our own kind of baked stuff that has a lot of the stuff people use already in there, especially like dev tool testing tools. Uh, so missing something here? Uh, no, that's good. So uh, then I can do a, uh, a steps commands uh, underneath the Docker executor here. As it's YAML, you need to have things kind of exact, right? And then from here, we could do the, the checkout command or check out because we need the code for that Docker file. That's the only reason why we need it. Uh, well, I mean, we need all the code, actually. That's not true. We need all the code to be able to do this. Uh, and then um, from here, we just say set up. Uh, uh, and it's remote Docker, which is telling the system that we need to attach uh, Docker container, right, to this build. Uh, and once we have that, uh, we can say, like, we have this concept of Docker layer caching, which makes things faster. It just crashes the layers of your Docker. And when you're building, like, huge projects, um, it can save you a lot of time. We don't really need it, so I'm just going to say false here. And it's one of those features anyway that's like a premium deal. Uh, so next step would be to then run, I believe, all of this stuff. I already had it set, set up, but all right. Well, let's just get rid of this stuff then. I, I had some of that already. Uh, cool. So yeah, so this looks like it's legit, right? Like um, we have a new job that we call Docker image. We're telling it run it in a Docker executor uh, using this image. We're going to check out the code. Then, uh, uh, yeah, we're going to set up um, the remote Docker uh, caching or the remote Docker sidecar container then um, then we're going to say run this right and literally it's just build the docker image so what we have here is a uh, command uh, key and basically i'm just telling it what what to build right so so or these are just a list of commands to run uh, now that i then i have a bunch of environment variables and what this does is it literally just uh, gives me a way to kind of dynamically build the name and then also leverage uh, environment variables. So with Docker Hub, since you know Cloud Run is going to have to pull this down from somewhere, uh, we need to build the Docker image and then push it to Docker Hub, right? Before anything can be deployed. So what I'm doing here is creating um, environment variables again to name my stuff. Now, if you see these these little bits here, which are like uh, Docker login, uh, and I think there's a password one here. Yeah, Docker password. What these are are environment variables that are stored in my Circle CI uh, in platform, securely stored, right? So those are my legit Angel Rivera login, username, and passwords, uh, which are stored. And when I need them, uh, these environment variables here are just placeholders, right? So that's a way for you to share secrets with your team, and, or share codes with uh, share secrets in your code with your team without exposing anything, which is really important like I did earlier with my codes uh, in the bash script or in the, uh, yeah, in the screen earlier. So uh, let's go ahead and um, jump into uh, the Circle CI framework or, or dashboard, I should say. And from there, we're going to go ahead and create these, these environment variables for my Docker Hub, for the Docker Hub piece. And by the way, Leon, from now on, your project will be able to leverage these so I might be taking these later, <laughs> Ooh, nice. point. but you can actually do this with your credentials as well. You know what I mean? So okay. the first thing is, uh, I'm just showing you, but you can replace them with your login later, right? Mm -hmm. And I forget what I used. Was it Docker login? Docker login and Docker PWD. All right, cool. So Docker, uh, let's see, login, um, I'm going to, Remove my screen for a moment. So can't see anything, right? Nope. I want to close my creds again. Or something yeah, I know that. That, that makes a ton of sense. <laughs> but I will, uh, yeah, da, 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 that looks good. OK. And I'm waiting for the UI to update. Sometimes uh, 
So By the way, I love here. the fact that whenever we talk about about things, uh, sometimes there is this little thing that pops up. Uh, in this case, it says magic trick to hide creds. Um, I mean, it's it's awesome. It's it's almost like there is a, a third party here that that you know helps us. My, my hat is protecting. No, I'm just kidding. You didn't mention the hat, man. I work specifically for you because you always. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I definitely appreciate it. I mean, it's the the first time I saw it, I was like, "Whoa, I need one of those." This present gift, huh? So maybe. Uh, so I'm having a time with uh, putting this on. Let me see something here. Let me refresh the page. Uh, so uh, let's try one more time. Sometimes the wacky things happen. You know how it is. Oh, I know what it is. I'm sticking a dollar sign in there, and it, yeah, you're not supposed to do that. By the way, I'll, yeah, you'll see in a minute once the uh, thing is it's masked, the password. Ah, that, that was my problem. And then what was the other one? Docker PWD. Yes. PWD. Yeah. And then this is the most important one to hide, really, but I get it away. I think that's right. And then it's, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, so let me put my screen back in. So yeah, so when you're putting these in, don't put the dollar sign. I, that's the mistake I was doing, and the UI wasn't letting me continue. And it says in the dialogue, do not put uh, dollar signs. See, it says right here, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> so I wasn't following. So we have those, those environment variables in there, right? So if we go back to the code, we can now see where like I'm building, right? So I'm building a name, uh, which is my log my login name for Docker, Docker Hub, and then I'm building this image name, which is a, a composition of. Let's go ahead and tag this as version one, right? Or minus one. No, no, no. We should we should do version three. Well, this and is like your. Ex oh, oh, okay. Uh, All right. I'm there you go. I was, I was going to say, like in the massive instructions I have in one of my other uh, repos, it actually says this is version three of the code. So, you know. All right, that's fine. <laughs> you got it, buddy. So, yeah, so if you see what's happening here, right, the Docker build commands, I'm just going to build the Docker image, and it's going to build it locally, excuse me, in the container. Then uh, the Docker CLI, in order for you to log into the Docker uh, system, uh, or at least, you know, to interface with the Docker repository uh, or registry online, you have to, this is the way they recommend you log in uh, to the client, right? Uh, once that's done, it's just a simple push, right? So I'm telling it, hey, this image, once it's built, send it on up. So one thing that we want to do is uh, basically go ahead and uh, I think we're done, right? So the first thing we want to do here is set up this, this, Docker build. Uh, can, we, we're, can we make one small change to Docker build? Yeah. So that it actually picks up the right uh, right Docker file. I, I was gonna jump into that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I sorry, that. sorry, my bad. It's totally fine, right? Like, so what we need to do, and Leon, a, a good point, is we need to do a, a file. I just saw that like while I was talking. So, <laughs> thank you for for pointing that out. Yep. Um, so, what's the? Is it CMD, right? It's a dot slash CMD, uh, cloud run uh, hyphen payment hyphen HTTP slash Docker file. Man. OK, you know what? <laughs> I'm just going to grab it from here. Where's the problem? <laughs> oh, no. OK, uh, I'll just type it, no problem. Uh, is it cloud run payment dash HTTP? All right, I, I think yeah. I could type it out. <laughs> The problem is typos, right? Is that yeah, true? Is? Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, I and got you. Docker yeah. file. Is it? Uh, I thought you could do right. Right. No, you're right. You're right. Because then you got to do right. You could. Uh, is it capital? No, you did it lowercase. Yeah, okay. I I did it with capital D. Yes. Yeah. And then dot. You always need that dot. By the way, just just remember that. That period is always a, a problem. Let me uh, get rid of that mini view. I don't need it. Uh, what is it? Mini, 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 mini. Side view, mini view. 
mini map. There it is. All right, gone. Cool, cool. So yeah, we have that that big old bad boy there sitting, uh, uh, tell you know, telling the the system to build it based off of that Docker file. That's absolutely right. Uh, and now um, what we could do is uh, we need to take this uh, build Docker image. And first thing, we're going to give it a test, right? And then first thing is going to be uh, the jobs. So, OK. So we're going to call this um, deploy. No. Let's call this workflow. Um, I don't know. What do, you, what do you think we should call it? Uh, let's just call it, um, yeah, build. Uh, build image? Build container? Build deploy. There you go. That's, that's a good one. Or that. Yeah. And then uh, we do have jobs, and then we need to start with this thing here, which is called, um, I think we call it a build uh, Docker image job. Cool. So let's start with that, right? Uh, and we're going to save that. Now, if we go into, um, I want to show you, do you know about the Circle CI CLI tool? I do not. Yeah, so instead of doing all those skip CIs and all that stuff, you could actually uh, run Circle CI uh, the tool. We have a tool, and okay. what we can do it is. Wait, can you can you make it sl slightly bigger? Sure, absolutely. Awesome, thank you. So we have this tool. Um, it's a CLI tool, right? And you can do things like config, uh, and then validate, right? So make sure that your YAML is legit, right? It takes checks your Circle CI thing. Uh, wow. Our YAML file, uh, and then you can also do a really cool thing called um, Circle CI uh, validate or not validate um, build. Now this does a, a job specific thing, uh, but we have E, uh, which is an environment variable we're going to need a couple of them actually, right? So we're going to do this uh, environment variable called Docker login, right? Uh, login, and then it needs to equal. Um, uh, so we're going to have to use a dollar and then parentheses. I have, I think I have this wired locally. So it's going to be uh, Docker, sorry, Docker. So on my host box, it has all of this stuff wired. Um, okay. Then um, we're going to have to do another one. Dash E. You see what I'm doing here? The reason yeah, why. Yeah. So, I'm sorry. Okay, I was going to say. So essentially, what you're what you're doing, if I if I understand this correctly, is allowing the uh, your your local machine to run the uh, uh, or at least run one of the jobs. And what you're doing now is what uh, we had like at the bottom of the Circle CI YAML. Where it had uh, the reference to the uh, to the environment variables, that's what you're adding onto the command line now, right? That's right. Yeah. So it's just a way to do things locally, just like your Kate, your uh, Kubernetes kinds cluster locally, mm -hmm. doing the CLI bit. So so right. So you don't have to push all the time, right? You can just test uh, things in it, and, and it does it in containers as well. So you need Docker for sure uh, to be able to do a lot of these things. So I think I've called this build, uh, no, build uh, Docker image. And that's basically oh, cool, man. all you need because it knows where to find your file. So, all right, so that command is not found. Oh, right, right. I should have probably just, um, oh, I know what I'm doing wrong. And yes, this needs to be just like this. Oh, that's what I did wrong, sorry. So I stuck the, the, it should be, you know, the environment variable you're going to use. And then it's not a command. I was hacking on something earlier today. Okay, so that's okay. Uh, why is that? Uh, build error calling. So maybe, maybe I have the wrong name. So that's probably what it is. And build Docker image. Did I save it? I didn't save it. That's why he's not detecting it. Okay, and then build and deploy. 
is what we're going to call that later. Build Docker image. Cool, cool. All right, cool. So um, let's go ahead and um, try it again. Unknown variable number. Da, 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 da. What's that? Da, 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 da. So it doesn't like my environment variable, which I'm not sure uh, is what, what, what that is. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see. It might be. It might be that I need to use this. So I'm going to drop my screen out for a sec. Mm -hmm. Check that I have those environment. I might. I might not have them assigned. Uh, so real quick. That might be a good thing to check, yeah. Yeah, and then, um, so let's see, print and uh, grab. Other sites, um, known variables, number. Maybe they're, OK, let me let me check the CLI. So uh, da, 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 da. let's go back. Let me put my screen back in. Oh, no, wait, let's clear all that out for sure. All right. Uh, okay. So let me go ahead and um, screen back in. All right. Can everybody see that? Cool. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and um, jump over to documentation, right? Because that's what developers do. Mm -hmm. Look at the box. And I know that we have um, circle CI, uh, CLI. That's what we need. Using it. Here we go. So yeah, if you get a chance, uh, Leon, check it out, man. It's just this yeah, save time. Um, so I'm looking for environment variables because I know I know I've uh, run into some issues sometimes. Uh, so see here, here's where we're getting into like um, you know execute, but you can use build as well. Um, oh, where's my environment variables? Uh, I, I know I'm going through this super fast, but uh, I'm pretty sure the flag is uh, is a dash e or dash dash e. I'm not sure. It didn't complain about the flag, so I'm assuming that's legit. Uh, complain about a number. Yeah. Let's take a look at the config. It's some silly thing I'm missing. Oh, oh, that doesn't need to be there. <laughs> that's not good. Oh, and by the way, the version. Okay, that's good. All right, that was probably it. See, sometimes uh, error, the messages are not the best. So, uh, yeah, we'll clear. All right, let's try this. Oh, it still doesn't like it. Did I save it? It did. What is it? What is this number business? What are we talking about? Hey. So Pulumi Cloud Run. Uh, oh, um, it says pipeline dot yeah. number somewhere. Could that be it? Pipe. Where, where do you see that? Uh, it says export tag uh, equals zero dot three dot pipeline dot number. Oh. Oh yeah. You know what? Yeah. 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 Yo, you're right. Yeah, yeah, OK. So let's go ahead and do this. Um, yeah, good, good catch. You know what it is? That is a thing that comes from, right. All right, so what we're going to do is we'll just do it. We'll, we'll assign it some weird number. Uh, yeah, we'll just do this. So that is valid in Circle CI. So we'll just say, hey, good catch, man. I didn't realize. That's a, a system generated thing in the platform. Good catch. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we'll just call it uh, 0 0.3.1, right? I don't know. Okay, okay. And then we'll say save. All right, this is it, Leon. Cross your fingers. We got it. Totally. We got it, brother. Oh, my goodness. Come on. What is, what is up today? All right. Did I save it? 
I have a tendency not to say no. Hmm. Why is that? No. Number. Let me take a look at uh, some previous things I've done here in the workflow section. Oh, it's, it looks legit, man. Like workflows built and deploy jobs. Build Docker image. Uh, let me just close this up for now because we don't really care. Oh, wait. We can't do that. Oh, that's why, buddy. So build deploy was the same as a job. Ah, OK. I'm going to mark that down as a a uh, we need to get better error handling on that and better messaging. All right, cool. I should have said something like you can't use a job and a and a workflow name, right? Like, it's not going to work. Well, cool. So let's. I think I, I get happy, but let's we'll see. It's like developer Nirvana, right? <laughs> of course, that was it. All right, ready? I am. <laughs> no <laughs> What is this? Error calling job. So we have error calling workflow, build deploy, error calling job, build Docker image, unknown variable number. Let's try this again. Maybe I'm missing something funky. Can you, can you just like remove the line that ha that you commented? Maybe maybe there is something weird. Oh, with this one. Oh, I see yeah. what you're saying. It's still because it's in there. I yeah, maybe. You. Yeah, yeah. That that actually makes sense too. No, you are absolutely right, because it's probably trying to uh, process it regardless. And actually, you know what? There is a, let's look at the docs real quick. There is a processing command and in that CLI. So there is a, where you can pack things, you see? So maybe, maybe we should try this. Um, the industry command is great for printing out structures. So maybe we should be using this pack command. But I'm not convinced yet because I've been doing these. Um, uh, this is for when you're actually building an orb, right? So let's go ahead and dig into config packing, processing a config. Here we go. So there are some flags here, config process. Let's try this one. I just want to see, like, I think this gives it like a dry run, you know? Okay. Uh, and uh, and then we're gonna go here and uh, paste. We're just missing that. Darn. I mean, if I if I would have just like known this existed, it would have saved me so much time. Essentially, yeah. if I just had read the documentation that you had created. But... Oh no, but like this is something I'll be doing a little bit more of with the CLI. If this is something that we really don't have. I haven't personally. Uh, I should be doing a little bit more with, and I will be in the future. So, this looks like it processed it. Um, let me let me just try it. Maybe. Hey, it Ooh. was that it was that that pipeline, dude. So, you you debug that. So what this is doing, obviously, right, is downloading. Um, the Docker images locally, right? See, it's downloading my Node 12 container. And from there, it's going to go ahead and, uh, well, what happened? Uh, invalid reference format, Docker builds. Okay, something happens. Uh, so it's, it's, it's the environment variables that uh, it doesn't like. So invalid argument for T. Oh, am I missing the tag? Let's see. So we have the tag. Uh, it's there. It doesn't like this for some reason. Tag is in there twice. Uh, which one? So you oh, have you Docker build T. minus T and then yeah. another minus T. Yeah, you're supposed to. Uh, that's for, for to build latest and also a version. Ah, OK. But you know what? You know what, dude? I'm just going to get rid of this. We don't need it for now. We can get rid of all the shit. Like, we'll just build the latest. Um, yeah, I had this problem before where we don't really need it for this particular instance, right? Like we'll, we'll get it up and running, save some time. Um, so let's try this again. 
hardest part was downloading that image. And it doesn't like invalid arguments. So something's something's not run or failed with invalid flag reference format. Wait for T tag tag. The arguments. So maybe uh, da, da, da. let's see what's coming on here. Uh, branch is there. Uh, there's no project though, is there? Do you see a project environment variable? That might be the problem. I don't see a project. Oh, that's actually really cool that it shows the uh, the environment variables and the ones that uh, that should be yeah. redacted or redacted. Yeah, yeah, that's one thing. Yeah, we we do uh, in the platform security, right? <laughs> yeah, that's so, that's important. I I just I'm really yeah. happy to see that. So let's take a look here. I think that I think that this this might be the problem. So let's in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is uh, probably build this locally so we have something in the cloud. Um, so I'm going to drop my um, <laughs> drop my screen again and then build this locally. OK, so that that I just good. don't want to expose anything. Um, so let me do this. And um, yeah, let me do this real quick, uh, Control C, and then I'm going to do it in. Uh, I don't know what yeah, the output. I would have totally expected that there would be like a pop-up saying more secrets from Angel or something. Yeah. What I'm going to call this is uh, Docker login. Let's just call it. Um, uh, I'm just going to call it Acme. What was it? Payment, right? I yeah. made that payment. It was call it that. Payments with an S. Okay. And then Cloud Run, Docker file. So this should do it. I'm building it locally. And let me get the next line of code that we're going to need to uh, log in and send that up. So right now, um, it's building everything. Hopefully, uh, it's just, does this do a lot of, OK, here we go. So I'm building this locally um, inside my uh, my local Docker system. Uh, I don't see anything that got. All right, so now I'm going to drop out to, to push it up so that there are no issues, or at least to log in and then get a token. <laughs> All right. And I can drop back in. So I logged in, and now uh, we can do uh, the other bits, which are Docker push and then the image name. So uh, yeah, that's it, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to do um, Docker push, and I think I called it, what was it? Acme payments, dash payments. So I have the, the uh, actually, what am I doing? You know what? Let me just do. Docker images, right? And we do have it right here. So we just grab this bad boy. See, it's local. It's a small, what are you using, Alpine for that? Yeah. Yeah. I like that. All right, so we can do uh, Docker push, and then it's it, it was called, uh, I think, Docker. login and then um, wait what am I talking about here I copied it for a reason there you go so now we're pushing that up to docker hub uh, so let's go to docker hub and see if my newly minted image is sitting in there hub I hope so docker.com not coker but that's for later. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's my cousin. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, let's see, sign in. All that login information. There you go. So we have, now we have this, right? Nice. The problem is in our pipeline, we're going to have to, yeah, we're going to have to use this name. So remember that. This, um, shit, this, and that's okay. We will, we will, uh, 
we will outfit this with a with a proper um, so the image name is just going to be uh, Acme Payments. Normally, I like to build it dynamically, but we're going to use this uh, for S and giggles, right? All right. So, yeah, I think that's yeah, I think we got it uh, at least for now. So we have an image, um, and actually, yeah, we can we can use this to build a new one, uh, and it'll just update the the one image every time. So we have that bit. Actually, can I get rid of this since it's already in your master, right? Like. This is a branch. You can yeah, yeah, totally. Get. Yeah, it's just throwing me off. <laughs> so great. So now we have an image, right? Uh, let's say we can build it and we can deploy it. It should be good to go. Uh, I'm just trying to think of what else is here. And so image name, Acme image. Okay, I should do it. Uh, let's go ahead and quote these. Just to, I don't know. Sometimes I feel a little bit better. So we have not pushed any code changes yet, right, to the, the, the branch. Uh, but now we should be able to leverage, um, be able to leverage sending up, let's, let's use this one again and get rid of that go. We don't really need it. Uh, so now we can leverage using um, CircleCI to build us a new, uh, or deploy this newly run uh, or newly built container, right? Uh, and then we need, I don't think we need this checkout because literally that file, the, the files are, I'll leave it, but I don't think we need mm -hmm. it. And the reason is uh, the checkout, well, actually, you know, we, we would need it if you, if you built the system or the naming dynamically, like I had it earlier, um, just cleaning, you know, jacking it up for, for a, uh, whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so, how to build? What's the tag for this? This is G uh, da, 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 pass. Ah, uh, does it does it need to be? Uh, no, this is the image name. So here, we would just call it um, uh, a Rivera, and then um, Acme payments. Yep. Platform is managed. Right, and then US mm -hmm. service name, uh, I don't know, we'll call it Acme Payments, because right? that's what it is. Uh, yeah, and then true. So remember that tick box that makes it public is true. Uh, I think we're just giving it a name, so we'll just call it Acme Payments, and, that, and then we can yeah. leave it with that. I don't uh -huh. think you need the build part, do you? Because we did the build part already. Yeah, right, right. That's right. You're right. I think. I mean, no, no. You're right. We don't need it because we, yeah, we, we. You're right. Absolutely. But this in it, that's the one that scares me. <laughs> it somehow it has to. So that that's another cool way to show people how to uh, wire up files as environment variables. So let's go back to the registry and look at the init process. So yeah, we need our our, our Google Cloud Services key. Uh, the way that you set that up is you have to uh, base 64 encode that that G, G cloud um, file. Uh, so what we're going to do is um, I already have that and you have to encode it as a value, right? So I always call this thing Google Cloud Keys, right? Okay. And are we doing good on time? We're almost there. Yeah, this should be working soon. I'm, I'm, I'm expecting it to at least. Uh, so we have the image up there. We need the uh, keys. So got to go back to your trusty uh, project settings, which is active okay. pay services. We're going to go ahead and uh, create a new environment variable. And we're going to call this Google Cloud Keys. I'm going to take my screen out. <laughs> and I am going to go ahead and uh, already have the the file so i have b i have some aliases that i uh, uh b64 encode and so so what this does is and then I, I give it the file which is um uh yeah so the file is in 
folder, or I thought it was, but it isn't. But it's in this folder. So. Oh, cool. So, uh, okay. I'm missing a component called XClip, but that's okay. App install. That's why I love Linux. You can just get your things most of the time really, really quickly, unless it's FFmpeg. You got to do a manual uh, compilation and build. <laughs> that, that takes 20 hours. And, yeah. OK, cool, cool. So let's run this again. All right. So now I'm not going to show that encoded value, because then someone could just <laughs> type it and then uh, Decode it, and then my my shit's uh, out there. So we're not doing that today, uh, but yeah, that's that's probably a good idea. So I encoding is not encryption, people. Uh, I don't don't let anyone tell you different. <laughs> I've seen so many <laughs> people get hacked in my life because they oh I base sixty four encoded it. It's it's encrypted. No, that's not encryption. All right, so let me drop my screen back in. So I created this cloud keys, right? And then I created a base64 value that has my uh, Google Cloud configuration file in it, right? So does that make sense to you? Yeah, so essentially what, what you're doing is you, you take the, um, the, the JSON that you can download from uh, the uh, Google service accounts and essentially take the input of that base64 encoded and then copy paste it into the value. Right. And if we look at the, um, so the nice thing about orbs too is that these things are uh, open source, right? So you can see what's happening in these things. Uh, and that's by design, right? So where's the, the registry? Here's the source for that init command, right? So you can see what's going on here, right? And by the way, I think I need to name that this though. Damn it. Uh, G Cloud Service Key. No, but I'm giving it, no, it doesn't matter. Uh, no, yeah, it doesn't matter because I'll pump it in that way. But as you can see here, uh, we probably need this project ID too, so I'll get that. Uh, but here's a service key, right? So when it initializes, it's going to use that key. And I promise you, this GCP CLI, which is another orb that it inherits from, has a decoding mechanism in it, right? So if you look, okay. uh, it tells you anyway, the documentation, uh, or at least it was showing, uh, tells us, right? Uh, uh, requirement, variable name, uh, yeah. So the only way you could save that file in an environment variable is by base64 encoding it uh, in circle CI. So let's okay. go ahead. And, uh, so we're gonna jump back down to, um, yeah, the config file, and um, we need to give it. Yeah, we need to give it the key. I believe, right? So go back to the init. He wants this parameter, and then right. We okay. So you know what might be easier if I just. It's not required, but what I what I should do is make that so it's the same name um, so what i'll do is i'll add another one uh where is that thing environment variables i'll just add another one uh with that same name right so uh and yeah let me drop out i was gonna say don't forget to stop sharing yeah and then i'm going to grab the uh value oh i left that good thing i left it um <laughs> e. And then I'm going to clear the hell out of this. Um, and then I'm going to bring it back up. There we go. Uh, and then we're going to call this we're going to leave it that. And then I need to grab the name that we were looking at. Yeah. All this m fun. But the good thing is you only have to do this once, right? Unless you change the key. Uh, yeah, unless you change the key. And the reason is obviously, right, these are only you can't edit these things once they're in there. So, so we 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 created this the one based off of the documentation, right? So that matches. So you don't have to assign that parameter. Otherwise, you would have to assign that parameter. Blah 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 blah. Right. So, just kind of trying to head things off at the pass. Um, so that's it. I think we're good to go. Um, okay. And 
we should be able to deploy your application uh, successfully, hopefully, in this this main run. So let's go back up to journal and talk about uh, checking what we have. So get status, and then yeah, I have one chain, so we're just gonna get commit, and then um, circle CI, and then config. We'll give it a message. Um, test uh, how to run deploy. That's, that's a good message, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, crap. Of course, a new machine, but that's OK. Uh, I'll do that later. Uh, ah, let's just do it now, because I know GitHub will probably throw a fit. So I just need to, wait, what do I need to do? Uh, That's OK. I'll just leave it like that for now. And I think all we have to do is push uh, oh, origin. And then what did I call that? Rivera test. Yep. So having pushed that, I'll make for yep successful run. Let's check the Circle CI uh, system. We should have a pipeline running. Uh, and you know what? We for, you know what? We forgot something. <laughs> Cancel. The reason why I'm canceling is we forgot to add to the workflow the deployment job. Ah. So, so we wouldn't I, ever deploy. Exactly. So you see here, it's only going to build us an image, but it'll never deploy it. So I oh, need to set okay. a, a, a dependency that says after building the image, deploy, right? Does that make sense? It or, does. Or, yes. Or, or you know what? We'll build the image. Eh, we'll, 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 we'll do it the right way, show people. I was gonna say <laughs> they don't need to, but I can hack it. We're doing good on time. Yeah, all right. Uh, this should be done soon. I promise. All right, how do I get out of here? Uh exit out of this bullshit. Uh, all right, just do that. All right, cool. So um let me jump back to the code and then I need to add this right here. And then we need to uh, add it as, um, right, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Long dash. And then from here, we need to, we definitely need to add the piece where it's, uh, you know, requiring the, the other jobs. So uh, what we need to do is back all that up. And then here is a requires key, I think with an S, is that right? Yeah, it's a requires. And then from there, we tell it that we make that dependency, right? So these are this is how you, otherwise everything will run concurrently. This is how you okay. link, uh, orchestrate your jobs to run in the same manner, right? Or in a uh, sequential manner. So, you know, you build these dependencies. So as you can see here, right? I'm telling the workflow, uh, start with this, and then don't run this uh, job, right? Build and deploy until this passes. So this has to run successfully, and then from there it will deploy the application. Does that make that sense? That makes sense. All right. Or it'll kick that job off, I should say. Um, so let's see, and then hopefully deploy the application. So again, we'll just do quick. Uh, I'm just gonna commit the same stuff. And then we're going to push, and then we're going to go to our uh, uh, pipeline. And then there's an error. And what did I miss? I missed uh, something here. It tells you here, string, uh, found a sequence, object. So expects, let's see. So one job expected string found. OK. So it's just probably in my config. I, did something weird. Is it build Docker image? Let me see here. Um, so yeah, so it requires, and then no, oh, this should this looks should be good. Build deploy jobs, build Docker image, build and deploy. And then I need a require statement. So whenever you need that, that should 
give me a build Docker image. Is the indentation okay? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. But, um, yes. Look. Okay. Looks like it. Uh, this this needs to be like that for sure. Uh, and you know, this is a great uh, thing to run the uh, Circle CI tool, right? Oh, actually, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So now I can instead of trying to push uh, things, that's a validate, and it hopefully should not error out. But this is there you go. So okay, let's let's read through this error in the file. Build deploy only one sub schema out of two. Zero sub schemas matched instead of one. Deploy job one expected type string. So found mapping schema string. And here's the input. So, oh, it's so it's something around here. Oh, I think I know what it is. So because there's only one, we should be able to get away with maybe doing this. Let's try that. Uh, right. Let's try this. That might be the issue. Nope, that wasn't it. So, expected type mapping found sequence. I'm not following this logic here. So, uh, requires build image. Anybody out there in uh, in uh, that's watching can. Uh, See anything that I'm missing? Uh, that would be cool. Well, there's two comments here. Uh, maybe somebody from Circle. I'm sure there's Circle CI people watching. Expect the type string found. Let's try this uh, file again. Build and deploy. I'm pretty sure these are all good. Maybe. No, yeah, it's two. Yeah, YAML's funny like that, right? Like if there's mm -hmm. something missing. And these look good. They're all in line. Um, and we're running the Cloud Run Deploy. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, is this implemented correctly, though? We robbed this right out of, uh, let's check the documentation that might be an issue with the with the implementation of the order but i i'm pretty sure we got it uh correctly let's see so build and deploy we did that all right check out uh deploy oh right so we we did call it cloud run i'm pretty sure because i copied it right out of yeah ah wait a minute this might be the problem yeah let me try this this might be it that the orb name was weird in the docs ah, okay. that might be, that might be the problem though Still, the problem of hmm. well, I know that was going to be a problem for sure. Uh, at least um, the name of that word, because when you define it here, uh, yeah, when we defined it here, uh, I'm not sure why this is happening this way. I tell you what, you know what? We're just doing a quick test of let's take that dependency out and then let them run parallel. That'll be quicker and, and that way we can finish this debugging business. Um, so I'll get rid of this and hopefully this will give us a a proper uh, way to debug validate. Okay, find or cloud run looking for command name cloud run int. So, so 
something's had oh, happened. Maybe that was because of the um, the orb that you renamed. Yeah. So, well, so up here, we, this is just a label. Oh, yeah. It's cloud run, not cloud that. It's uh, cloud dash run. Anyway, you see the name is and down here ah, it's uh, okay. A cloud run. So, like the example needs to get fixed for sure. Uh, we need to do some doc work. I need to submit some patches. Sure, um, but yeah, see, so there nice. was on multiple levels. Actually, you know what? I want to try something. Maybe if we have the time, right? To let's just re-add that. Um, requires, and I want to fix all this because I, I had a feeling this was right. The problem was this here. And uh, so, yeah, so <laughs> the naming is totally wrong. I have a feeling this is what it was. And again, you know, there are messages. Oh, all right. So we still have a problem. <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, we know that we can just remove that thing and get rid of yeah. it, right? But I'll figure it out later. Um, so we'll just get, matter of fact, I'll just, I think you can comment this. Save it. Oh, and then now I gotta get rid of this because it'll take a bump. You know what? Um, let's. I think this is this might be it though. Now that I now that I think about it, um, that might be the problem. Is uh, let's try. Uh, yeah, let's try this. I think that was the problem. So let me try running it this way. Okay, so. See, now I took that requires a bit out. And so there. Okay. For now, I don't understand it. Um, maybe, maybe. I mean, we can just run it parallel for now, and then you know we can yeah. we can, we can always do another session. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But um, let me just get rid of this, and then we'll run it in parallel just to just to get it going. Um, I just want to make sure it's valid. Yeah, we got that. So now we can just do a quick git commit and push it up. All right. Yeah, I'll I'll figure out what's going on there but yeah, at least the branch will be there so now right i took that dependency out and then what's happening here is these two things are running in parallel so we already built the image and it's going to pull down the latest so what we're interested in is is this orb right so as you can see here and it took a dump and why is because the key so it could not read in the file no json object could be decoded i don't know why that is but um hmm. why is that um anyway let's go ahead and uh so let me debug here g cloud service key uh then it wait it should do some sort of decoding though see this is what i don't like about um <laughs> this thing here. Uh, so I solved this before, and the way I did it was there must be some sort of um, decoding that needs to, it has to be that way, right? So no could be decoded. So I'm having an issue with the key. So what we could do is, um, if that's the case, right, I can do something like uh, in this in this job, I could actually do um, do my own kind of decoding, right? Like uh, put put that file. Well, let's see. Let's think about this. Uh, could we yeah. like save that for another one? I mean, I, unfortunately, I, I do have to. Oh yeah, no, if you know. gotta go, then yeah, we can. We can, we can. Matter of fact, if if you want. Um, I can stay on and if you need to bail, I'll finish this solo if you don't, I mean, if you're good with that. 
I mean, if we're if we're recording this, then absolutely, because I do want to see the end result. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. If you gotta go, what we'll do is, uh, yeah, we'll stop it here. Uh, basically, just some machinations, right? This is software development. It always happens. Uh, but basically, we're we're super close, right? I mean, we're <laughs> we're really close. Uh, but maybe we could jump on a stream uh, next week or something, real real quick, right? Like, Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Leon, for showing up. I know it's a wow. Yeah, we're over by a lot. It's always like that with me, by the way. So I get into it. I know. It. I know. All right. So um, again, thanks everybody for showing up, uh, and Leon for for going through like uh, that massive amount of um, uh, awesomeness with serverless. You haven't convinced me that to change my mind yet <laughs> completely, but I understand. Uh, have a lot better, especially about uh, K-native and, and some of the new things going on with uh, Lambdas, because I haven't touched it in, in years, to be honest, like, you know, uh, professionally. So thank you so much for walking me through that. I did learn quite a bit today. Uh, and hopefully, you know, unfortunately, we didn't get this to work, but, you know, that's how it is. Uh, takes a little bit of time to, to finagle all this stuff. We'll do it next and time. We, I mean, we, and we went cold, right? We, we weren't trying to... Uh, uh, what do you call it? We we went in cold. We weren't we weren't going to do this, right? So, uh, yeah. Anyway, we'll be successful next time, I'm sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, to you and the rest of the Circle CI team. Uh, I I learned a ton of stuff as well, so it was definitely worth it. Uh, and we'll we'll figure this out. We'll do another live stream, and it's it it's going to be awesome. And uh, yeah, so um, everyone out there, thanks for joining us and hanging out. Um, we'll be doing another one of these. We'll see if we can get Sir uh, re -get, re Gits or, or whatever. Because <laughs> at least I learned something. That's that's her name backwards. It's like yeah, exactly figure stuff like that out. But uh, you got me good. All right, thank you so much, man. Um, and thanks. <laughs>